Craig W. Murphy and I represent Deposition Services Incorporated. The date today is April 30th, 1998. The time is approximately 9.22 a.m. This is an NRA investigation by Mr. Uh, Judge Kenneth Starr, named the witnesses Ambassador William Richardson. This, step, this uh, interview with Mr. Whit Ambassador Richardson is being taken on behalf of the Office of Independent Counsel. This time the attorneys will identify themselves and the parties they represent, please. Uh, my name is Thomas H. Beener, Jr. Craig S. Lerner. This time the court reporter will identify herself and swear in the witness, please. My name is Elizabeth Beeson. Mr. Ambassador, would you please raise your right hand? Do you solemnly swear that the testimony you are about to give in this matter will be the truth, the whole truth, and the whole truth? <coughs> yes, I do. Thank you. Um, sir, could you go ahead and state your full name for the record? Uh, my name is William B. Richardson. And what's the B stand for? Blaine. B-L-A-I-N-E. Now, Ambassador Richardson, before we get into more substantive questions, let me just explain sort of the protocol to make sure you understand it and have no questions. We're operating as though we were appearing before a grand jury because our intention here is to show this video to the impaneled grand jury um, that the Office of Independent Counsel is currently using here in Washington, D.C. Do you understand that, sir? Yes. And by an agreement with your counsel based on your request that we try to do it at a place other than the courthouse because of your schedule and some of the matters you're involved in, we agreed that we would do that. Is that your understanding? Yeah, and I appreciate it. Now, everything I explained to you then as far as the procedures and the way we're operating is going to be as though we're appearing before a grand jury. Do you understand that? I understand. Okay, now as a witness before a a duly impaneled grand jury, you have a couple of important rights. And I explain these rights to all witnesses, uh, with the exception of perhaps law enforcement case agent types, but all precipient witnesses we go through this with. And that first right you have is a right under the Fifth Amendment not to incriminate yourself. And do you understand that the Fifth Amendment would allow you to refuse to answer any question that you believe in good faith could subject you to criminal liability? I understand. And do you have any questions about your Fifth Amendment right? Now, in addition to your Fifth Amendment right, you have a right to consult with counsel. And what that means for purposes of a grand jury appearance is that your counsel can't actually be in the room with us, but your counsel can be outside the room or available by telephone. And if at any time you want to stop the proceedings and go out and consult with your counsel, you're allowed to. Do you understand that? Yes. And are you represented by counsel? Yes. And in fact, is your counsel Mr. Justin Simon of the law firm of Dickstein Shapiro? Yes, he is. And in fact, today, we're at, at his offices in a conference room at his office, correct? That's correct. And is he present today? Yes, he is. And to your knowledge, is he available to you should you have any questions? Yes, he is available. Do you have any questions about your right to counsel? No. All right. Now, in addition to your rights, you have an extremely important obligation, and that is to tell the truth. Because this is part of a duly impaneled grand jury proceeding, and because we're taking everything down with the court reporter and you're under oath, Everything that you say here today is subject to the penalty of perjury. Now, do you understand that perjury is the knowingly making of a materially false statement? Do you understand that, yes. sir? Yes. And do you understand that perjury would also include not just giving affirmative information that's false, but, for example, saying that you don't have information or you don't recall information about a material fact when, in fact, you do? Do you understand that? I understand. And do you understand that if you were to commit perjury, it's a crime punishable by up to five years in prison and a fine of up to $250,000. Right. Do you have any questions about perjury? No. And I think that's all that I have, unless you have some questions for me. No, that's fine. And actually, the last thing I'm going to mention, although you've done an excellent job so far, <laughs> is because it's important that the court reporter be able to get everything down, um, number one, we want to make sure that we respond to everything audibly, so use words instead of gestures. And number two, I'll do my best not to speak when you're speaking, and I'd ask that <coughs> you do your best not to speak when myself or Mr. Lerner are speaking. Now, should I look at you or when I answer, or should I look at the uh, camera? It, it's actually whatever you're comfortable with. I would, I, I guess my suggestion would be assume that the camera would be the persons in the grand jury, and so it's really whatever you find most natural and comfortable. Okay. All right. All right? All right, sir, uh, why don't you go ahead and tell us what your title is, um, how long you have been ambassador to the United Nations, and what that entails, what your duties are. Okay. I am the American ambassador to the United Nations. Um, I was appointed in February of 1997, and I've served in that capacity 
uh, for approximately 14 months now. Yeah, it is a cabinet level position uh, based in New York City uh, with uh, a lot of responsibilities overseas and in Washington, D.C. And by whom were you appointed? I was appointed by President Clinton. And is this subject to confirmation yes. by anyone? Yes, it's, it's subject to confirmation by the U.S. Senate. So you were, in fact, confirmed by the Senate? A hundred to nothing. <laughs> I think that's a confirmation. Um, now, why don't, you mentioned you were based in New York. Why don't you go ahead and give us your addresses? First, let's talk about what is your work address and what is your residence address in New York? Well, my working address is at the United Nations Mission, uh, which is uh, right in front of uh, the United Nations. Uh, that's where uh, my offices and, and my mission, my embassy, is located. And I live, uh, my residence is at the Waldorf Towers, where it's the traditional residence for the American ambassador. And the address uh, is uh, East 50th Street for the residents. Um, where on East 50th Street? 50 East, uh, it, it, it's 50 East 50th. It's right um, next to the Waldorf Astoria Hotel. And, that, and you're on... What's the actual street address of your office at the UN Mission? Um, I can't recall. Okay. <laughs> but if, if, if we find the UN, we'll find the UN <laughs> Mission. It's right in front of it. What is the um, differential, if any, between the UN and the UN Mission? Well, there's 185 countries that are represented at the United Nations, and we are one of the 185. Uh, so what the U.S. mission is, it's, it's the American embassy at the United Nations. And in the embassy at the mission, we have all types of representation at the United Nations. The uh, political staff, there's uh, uh, Security Council staff, Economic and Social Council staff, and other agencies are represented uh, at the U.S. mission. Now, speaking of staff, tell us what your uh, immediate staff is at the U.N. mission in New York. Who you are the mean people? personal staff? Yes. Um, well, I have, uh, under me, I have four ambassadors. Uh, Peter Burley, who's uh, the Chief Ambassador, who is a uh, career officer. Uh, Nancy Soderberg, who is uh, my ambassador for peacekeeping. Uh, Richard Sklar, who's my ambassador for uh, reform and management. And a woman by the name of Betty King, who is my ambassador for economic and social council. Also in my immediate staff is, uh, I have two executive assistants. One is Isabel Watkins who's been with me for 10 years. Uh, Mona Sutman, who is a career foreign service officer, who's my executive assistant. Um, and a secretarial employee by the name of Deb Nelson. Uh, that would constitute my immediate personal staff in New York. I also have a personal staff, or a staff in an office in Washington, D.C. Okay, well, let's stay with New York for just a second, and then okay. we'll shift down to Washington. Okay. Let's talk about, um, as far as phone numbers, what is the phone number that someone would use to get you at your residence at the Waldorf Astoria? Is it something that's personal to your residence, or does someone call the general Waldorf Astoria number and then get an extension or get connected to your room? Um, we have a direct line. Okay, and what's the and, number? And that, that number is... Now, you can also get in touch with me uh, through the switchboard at the United Nations, the U.S. Mission switchboard. They can contact uh, my telephone. Uh, another way is... Uh, and what's that number, by the way? I don't know. Okay, it's just the general U.N. The general number. U.N. number. All right. Another way that I am contacted is through what is called the... At my residence, you're talking about. Mm -hmm. Is through what is called the State Department Operations Center where if the Secretary of State, for instance, wants to talk to me at, at my residence, she would call the State Department Operations Center, and they would contact me to my mission. Now, is that, you, you use the Secretary of State as an example for that. Is that 
method of getting a hold of you typically used by fairly high-ranking persons who are trying to get you, like the Secretary of State, yeah. or is that how just about anybody could get No, you? no, just high-ranking, high-ranking, Secretary of State, Under Secretary, National Security Advisor. Okay. And do you know the number for that? Yeah. Uh, it's and so that's a Washington number? Yeah. Okay, and do they have some sort of a pager that you have, or do they have other methods based on people who are with you that they get a hold of you? Um, usually they will, the call from the state operations center makes it easier <coughs> for the person initiating the call on me, like they may be on an airplane. So they'll call the operations center that will then track me down. Um, another way that I can be contacted is uh, through my security agents. If, if it's an emergency and I'm not with a, I don't ha I don't carry a pager. You don't carry a cell phone. No, hardly at all. Sometimes when I go into the Security Council at, at the United Nations, I'll take a little cell phone. And is this a, a particular cell phone that's particular to you, that with a set number, or might the cell phone change from time to time? No, it's a set number. Okay, and what's the number of your cell phone? I don't know. Is it one you got through work, or is it one that would be in your name? Uh, one that I got through work. Okay. And by work, the UN mission. The UN mission. I now, hardly use that, though. Okay. Um, now, what would be the number that someone would call to get you at your office in the UN mission? Um, well, the, gen the, the, the number of my immediate staff, uh, the number that I usually call when I want to talk to Isabel is... That's the one that I generally use to... Uh, call my immediate staff. It's either Deb or Isabel. And is that the number that persons are generally given to call you at um, your office? No, I think they're given another number. I think okay. there's a... There, it's another similar number. Okay. Is it your understanding that there are different extensions within your immediate yes. office suite? There are several extensions. And you would have an extension and then I assume Ms. Watkins would have an extension, and Ms. Salt, um, is it Sutphin? Sutphin. Et cetera, correct? Yeah, everybody would have their own extension. Okay. All right, now, let's talk about Washington. Why don't you give us your residence address, phone numbers, and your office address phone numbers here in Washington. Okay, uh, my office uh, address, I have an office at the Department of State. And that office is on C Street. It's the big Department of State building. It's the sixth floor. And in that office, uh, I have uh, four staff members currently that are permanent employees. And I believe a couple that are, um, one is secretarily and the other is a loaned uh, officer. And my Washington office is... Uh, headed by a woman by the name of Rebecca Cooper. And on that staff are an individual by the name of David Goldwyn, uh, Irma Martinez, um, Burgess Laird. He is the uh, loaned employee from uh, the Department of Energy. And, uh, let's see, Goldwyn. That's it for now. And what's the phone number? I don't know. Now, I don't, or I don't remember. Okay, let me ask you this, because it, it raises another question. Obviously, I assume when you're in New York, it's not unusual for you to call down to your Washington office, or at least to speak to people on the phone in the Washington office. Right. Is your typical practice when you're in your office, whether it be here in Washington or in New York, to place all of your own calls, or do you typically ask your secretary or someone like Isabel Watkins to place a call for you and then they connect you and then you get on the phone. Yeah, I always get have somebody place my calls. Okay. So is that one of the reasons why you suspect you might not be as familiar with the number? <laughs> That's the reason. Okay. All right. Now, um, what about your residence here in Washington? Okay. My residence here in Washington is rented, so um, we don't use that. What I do uh, when I come to Washington, which is almost three or four times a week, usually spending one night a week overnight, is I stay at the Watergate Hotel. And the Watergate Hotel uh, gives me space, uh, gives me a suite 
for government rate. Uh, and I frequently uh, hold meetings there. But it's not the same suite. In other words, I will get, uh, depending on availability, a different room each time I come, which averages about once a week. So I use that office uh, or that suite for meetings, uh, for my intelligence briefings, um, and, and just to basically overnight before I'm moving on. So by that then, is it accurate then that if someone wanted to get in touch with you by phone at the Watergate, they would just call the general hotel number yeah. and ask for your room? Yeah. And would right. the room typically be under Ambassador Richardson's yes. name? right. Okay, now let's talk about um, uh, your relationship uh, with certain people, and we'll go ahead and we'll start with uh, President Clinton. Yes. Why don't you describe your relationship with him? How long have you known him? How would you characterize the relationship? How often do you talk? Okay. Uh, I've known uh, President Clinton since uh, 1992, when he was first elected uh, to the presidency. Uh, I... Uh, was not one of the early endorsers of this campaign, but endorsed him before uh, the New Mexico primary, which was in June of uh, 1992. Um, I helped him in his reelection with uh, the Hispanic community. And uh, gradually, since I served in the Congress, I worked with him on uh, a number of issues relating to uh, his agenda. I was the chief deputy whip, so I was deeply involved in uh, a number of initiatives of his, the uh, budget agreement, the North American Free Trade Agreement, the uh, crime bill, where I worked very closely with him and his staff. Uh, in addition, I also undertook some troubleshooting assignments in the foreign policy field. Um, I would say my relationship with the president is a good one. We're friends not intimate friends, I'm not one of the close friends that he has. But um, we have a good mutual respect and uh, affection for each other. Now let me just make sure, I'll break this down a little to make sure we all understand it. So in the 1992, let's say the first term of the presidency, President Clinton, um, at that point you were serving in Congress? I was a member of Congress, right, from the 3rd District of New Mexico. And I was the chief deputy whip uh, in the Congress. So the, the purpose of the chief deputy whip was to push, get votes, get support for the administration's initiatives. And the president had these three big initiatives. And through those three big initiatives, I got to know him quite well. And these, would this have primarily been in the first term or second term? First term. First term. And then yeah. you indicated that you helped him in his reelection, which obviously would have been... 96. And I also helped in his re-election in 96. Okay. Mainly uh, by running his campaign in New Mexico. Now, how often do you meet with the president? Let's say, let's just take from January 1 of 97 as sort of a benchmark. So we're talking about roughly the last year, year plus. How regularly do you meet with the president? You mean uh, like physically? Mm -hmm. During the Iraq crisis, uh, we met with him a lot, his whole national security team. I would say there were national security related meetings, seven or eight, in which he was directly involved. Um, and what's the time frame of the Iraq crisis, roughly? Well, it was, it was uh, October, November, December, January. So, oh, 97 and into 98. Yeah, into 98. October, yeah. October, November, December, January. But we also had meetings. The national security team frequently meets with the president whenever there's a foreign policy issue. So we had other meetings with him uh, before the Iraq crisis on Bosnia, on uh, China, on Mexico, and many other issues. So I am frequently in the cabinet room with, with the national security advisors. Now, uh, I believe um, you indicated you often come to Washington, usually you're overnight at least once a week. Uh, on average, let's say in the last year, how often do your meetings 
involve meeting with personnel at the White House? When you come here on average once or twice a week, do you usually have meetings at the White House? Or Yeah, they're all, um, yeah. The reasons I come, I would say 75% of the reasons that I come to Washington are meetings at the White House in the White House Situation Room where the National Security Advisors gather. Usually uh, Tuesdays and Fridays, Tuesday afternoon, Friday afternoon, there's a Wednesday morning breakfast of myself and the Secretary of State and the Secretary of Defense, National Security Advisor. So there's a pattern of about three times that I come to Washington for those meetings, and those meetings are at the White House. And I take it from what you said um, about how the frequency with which you have physically met with the President, that you don't typically meet with the President at those meetings, but that he does attend the meetings sometimes when, for example, there are crises. That's right. I would say there's been maybe eight to ten meetings in that time frame that you mentioned where the President has attended those meetings with his national security team ten times. And since we were talking about the entire entirety of January, of, from January of 97 through the present, is it accurate that most of those eight to ten meetings would have happened in late 1997? Yes. yes. Okay. Now, what about on a non business basis, how often do you get together with President Clinton, if at all, in terms of do you ever get together on a one-on-one -on -one basis with him and or his family simply for social type functions? Not that much. Um, he's been to New York uh, twice, and uh, my wife and I have entertained him and the First Lady with other guests at our residence. Um, I've been to state dinners sometimes uh, after a national security meeting uh, I'll go into his office and we'll chat briefly but I wouldn't say we have a social relationship now when you say he's been to your house in New York twice I'm assuming that's twice all total not just in the last year yeah yeah because I, I've only had to held the job a year that's right since 97 I guess yes, that's okay. um, now, how often do you talk by telephone? And again, let's say, since you've been in this position as um, UN ambassador with the president. Very infrequently. By that, uh, less than once a month? Less than once a month, yeah. Can you estimate how many times you believe you've spoken to him by telephone since you've been ambassador? By telephone? You mean that I've initiated or he's initiated? Either way. Three times. Now, if maybe, maybe, maybe a little more. Not, not certainly on a regular basis. Now, when you have a telephone conversation with on these few times when you've had them with the president, if you needed to get in touch with the president, how do you go about doing that? Usually, what I'll do is I'll have Isabel um, contact uh, uh, Nancy Heinrich, or I will be. Uh, or I'll call, or somebody will call the White House signal operator. But it's us I usually have somebody place the call. But your understanding is, is that the call would usually be made through a White House operator yeah. or someone like Nancy Hearn, right? Yeah. yeah. And what about, do you have any understanding as to if there have been occasions when the president has contacted you by phone, how has that happened, do you know? Does he just call, you just... Yeah, he just calls the office. In the same manner anyone else would. Yeah. In terms of you'll get a, a secretary or someone will say, the president's on the phone. Yeah. I, I, as I said, I don't think it's happened that frequently. Now, are there other persons, and, and I'm going to confine this solely to persons who are working in the White House, assistance aides, et cetera, to the President, but who would be the persons in the White House, since you've been ambassador, that you do meet with or speak with with any frequency at all? In the White House? Yes, sir. Uh, well, Sandy Berger, the National Security Advisor, almost once a day. Um, Jim Steinberg, who's his deputy, National Security Advisor. And uh, on a frequent basis, that's about it. And then I'm assuming, obviously, you'll speak to other people on occasion as a need arises. I mean, that's certainly not the universe of persons at the White House that you speak yeah, with, correct? That, that's right. That's right. What I'd like to do, and, and I'm going to tell you now, and one of the things that we can discuss with your an attorney during a break is, I noticed that when we got some production 
um, from your office, and it includes a, a schedule for the month of January, but it did not include October, November, or December, and I'm not sure if that's because we didn't ask for it or if, if there's another reason for it. But one of the things that I'd like to do, and, I'm, and at some point I'm going to want to arrange to get those schedules um, for those three months, but I'm going to see if we can kind of roughly piece together your schedule in October. And what I'm going to tell you by way of a preface is we've sort of put together a list based on newspaper accounts and other materials that, as best we can tell, it seems to identify where you probably were. And with that ca caveat, what I'm just going to do is sort of tell you what it, the, the press accounts have suggested to us and ask you if that sounds right so we can just sort of bracket in some of the times. Although I think for your for, for purposes of expediting, I think we did submit uh, a list, a, a schedule of the general days in those months where I was. Okay, and to my knowledge, I think we got the one month. We got two particular days, and we got, so as far as I know, the month of January, but that was in the binder that I saw. Maybe there are an additional page right. in. And, and I'm not aware of it either, but what we'll do is we'll address that with your counsel. The bottom line is if there is more of a schedule that's yeah, no, given us, I'm not What aware. we try to do was, was say like October 5th through the 8th DC, October 12th through whatever, right. somewhere else. Yeah, no, I think we did okay. that. Okay, well let me see what I have because I'm really just looking for, I, what I guess I really want to just talk to you about is what were some of the issues that you were handling in that time frame sure. and then what were some of the big blocks of time? Like, it's my understanding that there was a trip to the Congo in there and there was a trip to South America are the two that come to mind and I right. just want to make sure we're clear on the times of those. Sure. Um, now first of all, is it accurate that you do recall taking, uh, that there were issues relating to the Congo in roughly October of 1997? Yes. And that at some point in October of 1997 you actually went to the Congo? Yes. And do the dates then, the dates that we have would be that you were in the Congo or left for the Congo on approximately October 23rd and returned somewhere around October 30th. Yeah, that sounds right. Okay. And then similarly, there was a trip to Latin America. Right. Or, and the dates that we have from press accounts is that the trip from Latin America was roughly October 13th through October 19th. Yeah, Does that, that, sound that about sounds right. right. Okay. Now, what were some of the other issues that were going on in the October time frame? You mentioned the Iraq crisis that heated up, correct? Yeah, the Iraq crisis heated up, um, the Congo issue. At the time, uh, right after the uh, Latin America trip, the President wanted me to work on the fast track issue. So I spent some time uh, in October and November working that here. And then in the UN Security Council, there, there's just like an issue a day, uh, every morning we meet. But the Iraq issue was starting to heat up, so uh, predominantly Iraq, uh, fast track, and then, well, the Congo trip took some of those days too. Is it accurate that at least during your term as ambassador, the Iraq issue and the Congo issue um, were among, if not the biggest issues that you'd had to deal with? Well, certainly the Iraq issue. Um, I wouldn't put the Congo in the same category, but um, along with uh, Bosnia and other peacekeeping issues and, and my whole effort to try to get the Congress to pay off the UN dues, the UN arrears, I would say those were the all-encompassing issues, but with the Congo at the bottom of those four. Okay. Was, uh, is it fair to say that October and November of 97 was a very busy time for you? It, yeah, it was it was intense. It was busy. It, it's always busy. Um, you know, it's always busy. It's always extremely uh, a lot of pressure, a lot of activity, day to day issues. Now let's go ahead and focus. And, and obviously the the issue that we want to address here is um, the interviewing of Monica Lewinsky by yourself and members of your office and the events before, during, and after that. Sure. So why don't you go ahead and tell us, what is the first time that you learned about someone that you later learned, or at the time, learned was Monica Lewinsky? Well, I believe that the first time um, this matter came up was in 
one of the meetings at the White House or somewhere in the vicinity of where we have our meetings in the White House, John Podesta, uh, who is the Deputy Press Secretary, uh, asked me if I would interview a person uh, that was uh, a friend of Betty Curry's for a position in New York because this person, according to John, was moving to New York. That was the first time. Uh, I believe it was sometime in, in early October. Now, the um, trip to Latin America, um, who all was on that trip as far as uh, what was the U.S.? delegation or who was there? Who wasn't on it? <laughs> well, John Podesta was on it. Uh, I was on it. Uh, six other cabinet members. It, it was a huge delegation. It was the president on the trip? Oh, yeah. yeah. He was head of the delegation and the first lady. Okay. And how did you get back and forth? Did you actually fly on Air Force One? Yeah, we were on Air, Air Force One. And the trip went to Venezuela, went to Brazil, and Argentina. And is as far as the persons who were actually traveling on Air Force One with you, would that have included Mr. Podesta, President Clinton, the First Lady, yes. and the other cabinet members? Secretary of State, uh, Secretary of Commerce, and other cabinet members. Yeah. Is it possible that you would have discussed with Mr. Podesta the issue of this person applying to your office, who later turned out to be Monica Lewinsky, um, at some point during that trip? Yeah, I, th I think there, there was an instance where John asked me if I'd received uh, her resume. And I remember responding that I didn't know. I do remember when John first raised this person with me. I asked John, well, what is her name? And John said, I don't know. <laughs> so this was pre-trip, uh, pre a few know, a week before the trip. Uh, but I believe we did have a conversation, John and I, on the plane, where he said, uh, he asked me whether I'd received the resume, and I said I didn't know. Okay. Well, let's go ahead then, and what I'll do is when we have conversations as best we can, we'll try to isolate each conversation okay. and go through as, as much as you recall. So let's start with the first conversation that you believed you had which w with Mr. Podesta, which would have been before the trip to uh, South America. Um, where was it, as best you can recall, and who was present? Oh, okay. Um, as best I, I can recall, it was in the West Wing, near the Situation Room, the, the bottom of the West Wing, the basement. And it was just John and myself uh, bumping into each other and, and him raising this with me. So no one else would have been present, but you no, and Mr. President? No, just the two of us. Okay, and what, as best you can recall, did he tell you? I, I think his, his words were, uh, there's a person uh, I'd like you to interview for uh, a position in New York. Uh, this person is moving there, and she's a friend of Betty Curtis. And I said, well, what's her name? He says, I don't know, but I'd appreciate if you just if you would just interview her. Did he say anything about what level employee she was, what her background was, anything no. along those lines? No, didn't say anything. Did he give you any indication of any kind of time frame within which he wanted you to talk to this person? No. Did he use any words um, of a descriptive nature indicating whether she was a good or a bad employee? No. Did you take, did you interpret whatever words Mr. Podesta used with you as a recommendation? No. Uh, I interpret it simply as a courtesy request for an interview, okay. which I get all the time from many people, from senators, other cabinet members, members of the media, from friends, from my wife. You know, this is very common in, in my position. Okay. Now, then, as I understand it, is it accurate that you wouldn't have any other recollection of any discussions with Mr. Podesta about this as of yet unnamed applicant until possibly during the South American trip? Yeah, that's right. Now, where do you believe the conversation on the South American trip would have occurred? It was on the plane, I believe. Uh, we were flying somewhere, and, and he asked me, you know, when you're moving around the plane. 
was anyone else a participant or listening in on this conversation? No. no. And what, as best she can recall, did he say to you at that time? He said, have you gotten uh, that resume uh, from this person? And I said, I don't think so, or I don't know. At that point, did he identify the person's name? No. Did you ask if you knew the person's name? No. Was there anything of a descriptive nature about the person? No. Did you interpret his statement at that point as any kind of a recommendation of the person? No. Anything further um, that you can recall about the discussion with Mr. Podesta on Air Force One? No, that's about it. Now, you would have returned on approximately the 19th of uh, October from the South American trip. Does that sound about right? Yeah, it was about... We left, I think, around the 12th, and then, yeah, it was about a week trip, yeah. And, and I can tell you, based on press accounts, at least, that the press accounts indicate that the trip, um, in fact, we have a press schedule relating to the trip of the president, and it indicates that the trip was to Venezuela, Brazil, and Argentina, right. Sunday, October 12th through Sunday, October 19th. That sounds right. Now, if you would have gotten back on Sunday the 19th, is it accurate that your next day in the office would have been Monday the 20th? Uh, yes. And that would have been in the office in New York? Well, uh, we landed uh, at Andrews Air Force Base. Yeah, I normally would have, I probably would have gone to New York, I, I don't recall. Now, what's the next thing you recall in terms of this applicant who turned out to be uh, Monica Lewinsky? I remember a resume appearing on my desk. Um, and it, I believe it had been brought in by Isabel Watkins from my staff. I, I, and, and I think that it was shortly, shortly after the Latin American trip. And what we'll do is we'll place in front of you um, a copy of the resume that I believe we got from your office. And uh, I guess this will be our first exhibit, man. Go ahead and let you number that. So we're going to call this uh, WBR-1. Yeah. And if you take a look at that, sir, does that appear to be the resume that you would have got? Yeah, that, that's, that appears that's right. Yeah. And you notice up at the uh, top left-hand corner, there's a, a fax indication that indicates 10-21-97 at uh, 3.09 in the afternoon. See yeah, that, sir? right. Um, and it says fax. Do you see that, sir? Yeah. Okay, does it sound about right to you that this would have been something you would have seen around approximately the 21st of October? Is that a Sunday? What's the 21st? That's a Tuesday. In fact, if you look, it yeah. shows a Tuesday right th here. Yeah, that's possible. It, it, I don't usually get the paper immediately, but it, and, yeah, it's possible that within that time frame. And what I'll tell you, just again as a point of reference, is, is that the press accounts that we have found indicate that you would have left for the Congo on the 23rd. Yeah, I left right after. Yeah. Right after I got back from Latin America. Okay. Now, first of all, let's talk a little bit about the actions, if any, that would have occurred between your getting back from South America and your getting this resume, we'll say roughly on the 21st or sometime thereafter. Okay? Uh, is it possible, sir, that you would have told, uh, strike that. Tell us about who Ms. Watkins is and what her duties are. Okay, Elizabeth Watkins has been my uh, executive assistant for about 10 years. She was my chief of staff when I was in the Congress, and I brought her with me as my executive assistant to the job, uh, to her present job at the United Nations. Her main assignment is my schedule and my personal affairs within the office, which are very small. It's just mainly scheduling is, is what she does. Do you believe, uh, sir, that you might have told Ms. Uh, Watkins upon returning to your office after the South America trip to, where's the effect of, to keep an eye out for a resume coming from Podesta's office on an applicant? Yeah, I think so. I think so. Yeah. And at this point, I, I assume you still would not have known the name of the person. Or right, I wouldn't know the name. Okay. And 
Do you believe it's accurate, sir, that after not hearing anything from Ms. Watkins about the matter, that perhaps a, a day or two later you would have asked her again about the matter? No, I think I just asked once. I think, uh, I, you know, we were pretty busy then. Okay. Well, if Ms. Watkins told us that she recalls that you asked about it once and then asked to keep an eye out for it, roughly, and then a few days later asked her if she'd gotten it, um, and when she said no, asked her to call Podesta's office about the matter. Do you believe that that's inaccurate or no, don't no, know one? I, I think that may be possible. Yeah. Uh, would you have any questions? Uh, strike that. Would you have any reason to question uh, Ms. Watkins' account of that if, in fact, that's what she told us? No, no. No, I just. Uh, she takes care of things like that, and, and I said, you know, keep an eye out for this thing. And, and that's all there is. Uh, it, it may have been that I asked again. That may be the case. And I guess that does lead me to the question that I would have, which is, um, it was a busy time for you, correct? Very busy. Yeah. And at the time when you were in the U.S. for this, looks like maybe a, a three-day period before you left for the Congo, you had a heck of a lot of things to deal with, correct? Right. Um, why do you, uh, if it is in fact true that you did ask Ms. Watkins a second time to check in on the uh, resume and to actually call Podesta's office about it. Uh, why do you think he would have done that? Okay, let me, let me talk to my... Can I take a break? Absolutely. Hi. And what I'm going to say is just for the record on my clock, it's uh, 10.04 and we're going to take a break while Mr. I'm sorry, Ambassador Richardson discusses yeah, with his counsel. Yeah. Be off the record, 10.04.03. Back on the record, 10 or 7.59. Okay, now um, we were talking about um, what, if anything, might have transpired between your getting back from the South American trip and um, prior to receiving the resume that we've marked as WBR number one. Right. And um, at this time, it, it was an active, busy time for you, correct? It was busy, but it was not the most intensive period. The Iraq issue did not explode until the end of October. It, it was busy, but Iraq had not started to percolate then. It, it was starting with some problems, but I recall it wasn't until I got back from the Congo that it really exploded. Which would have meant at the end of, uh, end of very October. end of October. Yeah. Now, and at this time, and again, we're focusing on the time frame from, say, October 20th, to October, say, 22nd, yeah. when you got back from South America and before you left for the Congo, right. okay? Um, as, in terms of this potential applicant that Mr. Podesta had mentioned to you, you didn't know the name of the applicant, correct? Right. You didn't know anything about the background of the applicant, correct? Right. You didn't know what level uh, employee this person was hoping to be, correct? Um, th was this before I saw the resume? Yes, sir. Because we had a vacancy in my uh, Washington office, a slot that I had wanted to move to New York that was outreach oriented. And so I knew there was, there was a vacancy. Now, um, but I did not know until I saw the resume about the qualifications of of Ms. Lewins. I didn't even know who it was until I saw the resume. Okay, well, first of all, when you say outreach-oriented, what do you mean? Well, specifically, I uh, had hired a new chief of staff who wanted to bring somebody in that could do liaison with the United Nations community to try to sell the UN. We were having problems getting funding for the UN. Uh, she wanted somebody that could uh, liaison with uh, business groups. Uh, she wanted somebody that would also help me with advance for my trips. She wanted somebody that uh, was uh, a public affairs type. This was the same position that uh, a woman by the name of Gina Griego in my Washington office had. We wanted to expand it a little bit, move it, uh, move it to New York. Now. 
prior to getting and seeing the resume of Ms. Lewinsky, however, you had no idea what level applicant she might be, correct? Yeah, that's right. And to your knowledge, the person that Mr. Podesta had been referring to could have been an executive level person, correct? Um, yeah. So, in terms of this unknown, unbackground, uh, known applicant, is it accurate that there was no particular position that came to mind that this applicant might be good for prior to getting the resume of Ms. Lewinsky? That's right. Okay. So, given the various matters that you had ongoing and giving the somewhat tentative nature of who the applicant was and what they'd be applying for, uh, why do you think you would have asked your secretary, or I'm sorry, your executive assistant, to do a, a second follow-up to Podesta's call? Well, I don't know if I did. I might have done that. Uh, that in other words, can you get the resume? I, I, don't, I don't know if I did. I think I asked when I got back, I said, did we ever get that resume? And uh, I don't know whether we got it right away, or I don't know if I asked them for a second time. Um, I do know that uh, the resume appeared on my desk, and I said to Isabel, um, I have told uh, John Podesta I'd interview this person, set it up. Now, you indicated to us a little while ago that you frequently get requests from people who want you to interview someone, correct? Yeah, that's right. And these are frequently made by high-level people, such as senators and other um, cabinet-level people, and, and probably the the highest level uh, person, like your wife. The, that's right, yeah. Um, do you typically, when people tell you in passing that they might have someone send a resume, is it your typical practice to have your secretary affirmatively contact those persons to get the resume? Yes, and, and I interview people. Um, when I first selected my staff, I interviewed a lot of people, myself. Uh, I feel very strongly that if I'm going to consider somebody, I do the interview myself. Uh, it's a hands-on approach that I've had since the Congress. And I would say that every person that I have hired in my UN office, in my Washington office, I have interviewed. Uh, and I operate on, on gut instinct with people. So it is very common for me to have, in the course of my activities, interview re uh, interviews with people who I'm asked to interview uh, or I'm asked by somebody if I can give advice to this person. Uh, very high-level types asking me to do this. And, and I think it's, it's part of my own, uh, I think, respect for others that, that ask you to interview people. And, and also, if uh, there's a possibility that I would hire the person, I interview them myself. I insist on that, even the lowest level. In the time period from, say, September of 1997 through the end of January of 1998, um, how many people did you personally interview as possible employees of the UN? Um, since, since I was, uh, well, I'd like to go back to probably December when I, my appointment was announced. December of, of, of 1996. Of, of yeah. okay. How many have I interviewed? people? Mm -hmm. About 75. And it, I'm assuming, sir, that a large yeah, number of those... 75, <laughs> they, you know, I'd say 60 to 75 with, you know, a large number at the beginning when I was first staffing up. And is it accurate, sir, that upon your appointment, as you an ambassador, it's, it's part of what you do, or are entitled to do anyway, to go ahead and choose your entire staff, correct? That's right. And so most of these people would have been people that in the late 1996, early 1997 stage, you were interviewing to get your staff in place so you could begin your work as you an ambassador, correct? That's right. And I hired every one of them. I did not, uh, I took referrals uh, from agencies, from the White House, from the Congress from the outside community, and I hired every single person. I made the decision on every single person on my staff. 
Now let's go back to the time frame of the, the latter part of 97, early 98. So let's say uh, September of 97 through January of 1998. How many people have you personally interviewed during that um, three or four month period for a position in your office at the UN? All right, September of 97? Yes, sir. Well, I'm just taking a month right before the Lewinsky interview through January of 98. Five, six, seven. Okay, and, and who were the other people? Well, I, I don't know. I mean, I'll get it for you if you want. Okay, well, do any names come to mind? Um, Till January of 97? Of 98. Of 98. I mean, no names come to mind. Uh, what were the positions that you were interviewing these people for? Um, they were similar. They were press jobs. Uh, they were uh, uh, jobs in, in the press office where most of my vacancies occur. Um, there was one position uh, um, in the protocol office that I remember interviewing for. Uh, there were positions uh, mainly on my, well, Rebecca Cooper. I, I think I hired her during that period. And uh, yeah, Rebecca Cooper, uh, September. Now, Rebecca Cooper sat in with you yeah. on the interview of Ms. Lewinsky, correct? Right. Okay, so she would have at least been hired by that time, correct? Right? Yeah. Right. Do you have any estimate of how long she had been working for you at the time that you interviewed Ms. Lewinsky? Um, well, I know I selected her over the summer, but she went through, uh, you know, her security clearance. Uh, she'd been working for me about a month, I think, or, or maybe a little more. an aside, I guess we're having the hammering session. I'm sure it'll make our, our tape sound good. It'll be better than my coughing. Now, um, now let's go ahead and address the, uh, the resume uh, of Ms. Lewinsky. So that would have come in at least according to the top of the page on October 21st, uh, Tuesday at around 3.09. It was faxed from do you see that, sir? Yes, I do. And do you recognize that exchange to be a White House um, number? Yes. And there's a name next to it, Debbie Schiff. Do you see that, sir? Right. Do you know who Debbie Schiff is? Yeah, I do. Who's Debbie Schiff? Debbie Schiff was the receptionist in the West Wing, in, in the upper part of the West Wing. Uh, and she would greet people. And uh, I knew her when I was in the Congress, whenever the leadership would come in to meet with the president when I was a member of Congress. She was, she's the receptionist there. She was the receptionist. I think she's left. And so who is it that you understand she directly works with? I don't know. I don't know who she works for. But she's a receptionist, I think you said, for, the, for who now? At the White House, uh, for the West Wing, for the, it's, it's sort of a protocol position. You walk in, and she asks you to sit down, and she says, who do you want to see? Do you know whether or not she works directly under Mr. Podesta, for example? No, I don't think so. Right. Do you know whether she works um, directly under the president in terms of as part of his immediate staff, or is it no. your understanding she's No, it's, it's not that high level of position. Now, upon receiving the resume, do you have any recollection of uh, talking with anyone about the resume or the fact of its receipt or anything like that? No. I don't think I talked to anyone. I'm assuming you looked at the, at the resume, correct? <laughs> yeah, I did. <laughs> um, now, once you saw the resume of what is now identified in the resume as Ms. Lewinsky, what, if anything, did you conclude should be done? Well, I uh, looked at the resume. I must say that uh, the resume impressed me. Uh, she worked uh, in the Department of Defense. She had worked for somebody that I respect, Ken Bacon. Um, I saw that she'd worked in the White House in the legislative affairs. As a former congressman, I thought that was impressive anyway. And uh, I, I remember seeing, seeing that. And I told Isabel, I said, 
you know, let's schedule, uh, as I told John Podesta, an, an interview with her. I told John I'd interview, try to schedule it. And uh, I think that's what, that's what you did. Uh, do you believe, sir, that you would have called uh, Ms. Lewinsky at some point in the time frame of after receiving the resume on the 21st, but before you left to go to the Congo on the 23rd? You mean me calling her? Yes. No, I don't think so. Um, I mean, Isabel would set up the meeting. Is there any reason why you might, as part of your practice, call an applicant like Ms. Lewinsky to discuss either her resume or anything along those lines before you would um, actually meet with her? Well, there, yeah, I mean, there were instances where, in the past, um, if I was seeking somebody, I, I probably called and said, listen, there's this position, are you interested in interviewing? I think I may, might have done that. And I guess my, my question would be, sir, if Monica Lewinsky represented to other persons at the time that you personally called her on or about the 21st of October, uh, do you believe that might be true, is absolutely not true, or that it is true? I don't think it's the case because Isabel sets up my meetings. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and um, use the next exhibit, which will be, which will be government's exhibit. WBR2, and I'm going to place it, I, uh, she's, the court reporter will give you a copy, but I'm going to let you look at it while we're waiting at my copy. Okay, I'm going to hand you that. And, sir, I'll represent to you that this is a, uh, a phone record that we received via subpoena that purports to indicate calls from your office. Do you see that, sir? Yeah. Okay, and if you look at the record, it shows one, two, three, four, five calls. Do you see that? Yes. And it gives a date, and it gives an extension, and it gives the, uh, the number called, and then a name, which unfortunately is cut a little bit off of the page, but over at the right-hand side of the page. Do you see that? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Now, looking at those calls there, do you see, sir, that there are, um, on that page, there are three different extensions indicated. The first call, for example, which occurred on October 21st, at 19.01 or 7.01 p.m. shows a call from extension. Right. And it has the name William R.I. And, and if you see where it comes over to the next page, yeah. Richards. You see that? Right. Under that, there are three calls that have the name Isabel Watkins, and they show the extension. Do you see that? Yeah. And then finally, there's a call that says Mona Kai Sutphin that has the extension. Do you see that, sir? Yeah. Is it accurate, sir? that your extension at your office in New York is that the extension of Ms. Watkins is and that the extension of Ms. Uh, Sutphin is That's probably correct, but anybody uses my extension. Many times I get my staff to place my calls right in my office. I'm sitting on a sofa and I say, you know, call so-and-so and somebody will go in the desk and place a call for my extension. I mean, that's very common. Now, how, did, how is the layout at your office in terms of phones? So I'm assuming there is a phone in your physical office, correct? Um, yeah, there's two phones. There's one on my desk, and there's one on my sofa. And then there's, uh, right outside my office, there's Deb Nelson, who's the immediate ex assistant, who mainly answers phones and helps out with uh, correspondence and then you s go to the right and Isabel Watkins and Mona have separate small offices and they have phone each of them has their own phone on their own desk correct yeah right and would your understanding be then that the extension that would be at Isabel Watkins <coughs> desk would be the extension and the extension that would be at Mona Sutton's desk would be the Apparently. I mean, if you ask me what my extension number is, my direct extension, I guess it's... I don't know. That's the number that I call when I'm trying to get a hold of Isabel. Okay. And but is Isabel the person who normally answers your phone and says... I'm usually, to yeah, so. usually I want her to answer the phone because <coughs> it's something schedule-related. Um, but I usually encourage her to answer the phone first.
when I am calling that number. Sometimes it doesn't happen. But the point is that my extension is used by everybody. Many people will use that extension to make a call, especially if they're in my office and I say, get so-and-so, or Isabel may be in my office when I'm calling from in the Security Council. But now, would you have a calendar that would reflect whether you were, in fact, in your office on October 21st? What, what day is that? That's a Tuesday. No, I don't keep records. Okay, well, I mean, you're hit, you have a calendar, correct, that shows where you would be on a given day? Well, Isabel would keep it. I mean, I don't have one. Well, remember we talked a, a few minutes ago about the calendar and the fact that we had gotten a page from January of 98, but we, at least to my knowledge, did not have October, November, or December of 97. Yeah. It, I'm assuming that that's a calendar that maintained by your secretary, but that shows where your appointments are on any given day, correct? Oh, yeah, yeah. I, I thought you meant whether I kept it. But to your knowledge, there is a calendar kept, at least that would show your appointments and, for example, would show whether you were in Washington, D.C. Yeah, versus yeah, New York. Yeah, and that's what we've tried to do in this, I thought you'd have it, um, day by day between the period in question to now. Um, when you look, reflect back on it, and again, using the benchmark dates of Oct uh, October 19th on a Sunday is the day you got back from South America, and October 23rd, which I guess is a um, Thursday, right. as the day that the press says you would have left for the Congo, right. do you believe that you would have been in New York in those intervening days? Um, in New York and in, in Washington, probably. Um, now, if we direct your attention to exhibit WBR2, which is the phone list in front of you, right. um, and if we look at that first call where it indicates October 21st, 1997, at 19.01 or 7.01 p.m., a 5 minute and 42 second call to Washington, D.C. from the extension where it has the name William Richardson next to it. Right. Um, do you agree that that is likely a call that was placed from your office, from your phone, um, on that time and date? Well, it could be placed from another office. I, I think that the can also be placed from Isabel's office. Because that's your line, correct? Yeah, because that's my line. And she has one of your lines there as well. She has one of my lines. Um, and I'll represent to you, sir, that the number that is there is uh, Monica Lewinsky's apartment at the Watergate here in Washington, D.C. You see yeah. that, sir? Yeah. No, I see. Um, do you believe that you might have spoken to Monica Lewinsky on the night of October 21st for approximately five minutes? No, I, I don't believe so. I think Isabel spoke to her okay. to, set this, uh, to set the meetings up. Is it possible that uh, Ms. Watkins placed the call from your office, had it on the speakerphone, you were to say some words to Ms. Lewinsky in the course of that conversation, even though Ms. Watkins placed the call from your office? I don't think so, no. I mean, I don't, I don't remember ever talking to her until I actually saw her in my uh, suite at the uh, Watergate Hotel. You, you should ask, I think your people asked Isabel. I mean, you, this, this would be easily cleared up by her, I would think. Mm -hmm. I mean. Okay, if I can just have a moment here. Just looking for something to make sure I'm keeping track of the document. So you then would have left on the um, trip to the Congo on approximately the 23rd, coming back on approximately the 30th. Um, is it your understanding that prior to your leaving, you would have made a decision to interview Ms. Lewinsky based on the resume? Well, in my mind, yeah, that after John had asked me 
and after, uh, yeah, the, in principle, I knew I was going to interview. Uh, I don't know if I made that decision before I went to the Congo or not. And then would you have given any instructions to anybody in your staff to set up the uh, interview? Yeah, I would have said to Isabel, Isabel, uh, please set up the interview uh, with, with, uh, with Lewinsky. I would have said to Isabel, set it up, and then I assume she'd, she'd do that. Okay. Why would she have placed the call on your line as opposed to her own line? She does that frequently. I mean, th this happens. My, my extension is used intermittently by all kinds of people. She may have been in the office when she called her. She may have been in my office. Okay, and now what we're going to do is if we can direct our attention to, I think we'll call this, um, Government's Exhibit WBR3. So I'll just ask you to look at this, and, and what I'll represent to you is that this is a summary. Uh, he has a slightly different version from okay. yours, actually. Let me see if there's a correction. We want to make sure we have everything accurate. What's the... Um, One second. Sure. Well, what I'll do is I'll place mine, which will say W, B. All right, this is the accurate. Why don't we label this one? Actually, no, wait a minute. This is... So which one is... is okay, mine one. is the one that's wrong. So he had the right one. There we go. we we'll place that back before you, sir. Right. So WB3. And, sir, I'll represent to you that this is just a, a summary made from phone call records that we got via subpoena right. of calls back and forth between October 24th and October 30th of 1997 from the extension with the name Isabel Watkins, which is to Monica Lewinsky at two different numbers, either the Watergate number that we told you before, or Monica Lewinsky's Pentagon office, which is... Okay. And just for purposes of the record, WBR3 contains 11 different uh, phone calls. Do you see that, sir? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now. Was it your understanding that um, it was during this time or between roughly the, the 20, anywhere from the 21st of October till you got back from the Congo on the 30th of October that your secretary, pursuant to your instructions, would have been trying to set up an interview? Yeah. Okay. And do you notice that in terms of WBR3, all of the calls are very short, right. um, ranging from 30 seconds to I think a minute and 45 seconds being the longest, correct? Or it could be that these are recordings, right? Or yeah, messages, yeah. that sort of thing, yeah. correct? Yeah. Okay. And with this, at least, uh, I realize you didn't make these calls, but is that at least consistent with what you would have expected to happen, that there would be some calls back and forth of a scheduling-type nature between Ms. Watkins and Ms. Lewinsky? Yeah, because my schedule probably changed, and, and you know, we were trying to get coordination for, for her to be interviewed by me, because my schedule is always changing. Okay. Now, if you notice... Um, in terms of these 11 calls, all of them are, f um, all of them are from the, or to the extension, which is the one that comes back to Isabel Watkins name. Do you see that, sir? Yeah. And so, and, and I will represent to you that we have looked over all the phone records we have and we did not see any records um, during this time frame, namely between after the call on the 21st from the extension up until the call, uh, up until the 30th, we did not see any other calls from the extension. Okay, sir, now, yeah. um, do you know why, if, if Ms. Watkins made 11 calls from, from and to her extension, but we do have the extension on the 21st, in your mind, is there any rhyme or reason to when Ms. Watkins would choose to use your extension versus her own? She frequently uses my extension. Uh, you know, that's all I can tell you. She'll place a call for my office and, you know, talk herself or I'm in, you know, in a reading something. And that frequently happens. Is it accurate, sir, that when Ms. Watkins places a call from the 
extension, it's typically because it's a call being made at your direction or in relation to something for you. It could be, but many times she, sometimes when I'm not in, uh, in the country or I'm not using my office, she uses my office. Uh, she used to do that in the Congress. She'd place her calls for my extension. I mean, this is fairly common. I totally trust her, and I don't see any uh, inconsistency with her placing a call from, from my direct line. And, and I think others in my office might do that, too. Deb Nelson, I think, does that, too, who I asked to place calls. Okay. Now, up until this time, because where we are now is, let's take us up to the date of the 30th or all the way up to the 31st of October. You're back from the Congo, right. and as you recall, the 31st of October is the day, Halloween day, that you actually met with Ms. Lewinsky, correct? What was it? Uh, according to your first? summary, and we'll show you that, but uh, that's the record that we have, okay? Can I step back for a moment? Uh -huh. Actually, I think you returned from the Congo the 29th. You attended a big gala event for the president of China the 29th. Is it possible that you, uh, I can represent that to you, I, I think that newspaper records reflect that. Is it possible that you had any conversations with Isabel Watkins on the, the 29th and the 30th about, about Ms. Lewinsky and trying to schedule an interview? I don't the 31st? know. You don't I remember don't, I don't remember meeting with the president of China. Well, I in fact, they, I wanted to ask a question. It's a big state dinner. Does that, uh, I think there was a newspaper article, there was a big state dinner for uh, Cheng Ming. Were you I president? I don't that? think I was Oh, you there. weren't. Right, and, and, and I think this yeah. is one of those, because. If you weren't present, there. do you believe that was consistent with you wouldn't have gotten back from the Congo until the 30th? Yeah, probably. If okay. the dinner was on the 29th? Yeah. Um, I don't think I was there. Okay, it, was, it may have had the, the guest list and actually you didn't get back from the Congo in time. Um, now, up until this time, and we'll say up I, until... I, you know, I don't want to get no, up. No. I don't think I was there. <laughs> Up until, let's say, the 30th, 31st, <coughs> the time when you actually interviewed with Ms. Lewinsky, did you inform anyone um, who worked at the White House that you were going to interview Ms. Lewinsky? No. Did you talk with anyone at the White House about Ms. Lewinsky to get any background on her or anything? No. Did you talk with anyone at the Pentagon about Ms. Lewinsky? No. Did you talk to anyone anywhere about no. Ms. Lewinsky? Now, I know you referred a few moments ago to what you thought was an, a, a subsequent conversation with Mr. Podesta yeah. about Ms. Lewinsky. Do you believe that was after the interview? No, that was before. That was uh, during the trip. Okay, which trip are we talking the, about? The Latin American trip. Okay. So, it, you didn't have any... After the Latin American trip, and let me back up to make sure we're keeping things organized here. The conversations you just referred to on the Latin American trip those were all prior to receiving Ms. Lewinsky's yes. resume and prior to deciding that you would definitely interview her, correct? Yes. Do you know whether you ever spoke to Mr. Podesta again about Ms. Lewinsky? No. Is that, you did not speak to her, or to him, or you're not sure? No, I, I'm for sure. I never spoke to John Podesta after uh, the interview. Okay. And you didn't speak to him between the time you got back, about Ms. Lewinsky, between the time you got back from South America and the interview? No. no. Um, so let's talk a little bit about um, the interview. Who was present? Where was it? How long did it last? And let me go ahead and show you a um, schedule. We'll call this WBR. Sort of our writer. Probably better. Pass that to the court reporter. Do you recognize, sir, is this a document that you would routinely get? Yeah. And what is this? Well, this is my schedule for the day that is prepared by Isabel Watkins. And um, let's go ahead and go through the entries on the schedule. Right. Um, up at the top of the page, which I'm assuming is a carryover from October 30th, is that your typical routine? It would carry over from the day before? Yes. Okay. So at the top of WBR, um, 5.15 p.m. principals meeting on Iraq. Right. Is that because this Iraq crisis was starting to heat up? 
Yes. And I think you told us a few minutes ago that you remember that things had really started to heat up with Iraq after you got back, by the time That's you right. got back from the Congo. From the Congo, yeah. Um, 7 o'clock meeting with Mike Parker. Who's Mike Parker? He's a congressman from Mississippi. Okay. And then we'll, we'll pass over the 7.30 a.m. meeting with Ms. Lewinsky and come back to that. But now we're on October 31st, and let's just go through some of the people you're meeting that day. 8.30 a.m., Ben Gilman. Who is he? He's a congressman from New York. Uh, and all of these here, Ben Gilman, Becerra, Lowy, Hefner, Skelton, Clement, Pastor, DeLay, Grams, meant so we are members of Congress, and the purpose there was uh, fast track. Okay, so you talked to them about fast track. So you had several meetings, it looks like, throughout the day with uh, at least the night before and then through 12, 30, 1 o'clock with uh, congressmen about fast track, correct? Yes. All right, then 1 o'clock speaking engagement, Earthkind National Press Club. Right. So you spoke at that? Yes. Then you flew back to New York. Right. And then this 3.30 meeting of the P-5 re-Iraq. Right. Um, What's the P-5? These are the permanent five members of the Security Council, the United States, Russia, China, Britain, and France. It's the ambassadors that, I guess, got together that day. Mm -hmm. And then um, you had a Security Council meeting, and that's United Nations Security Council right. at 4 o'clock? Yes. And then you did a CNN interview later that night, correct? Yes, I guess I did. Yeah. Now, it's a pretty full day, correct? Pretty full day. Is this sort of a typical type of day you were having during that time period? This is a typical day for every day, uh, 7.30 to 10 p.m. <coughs> every day, including sometimes Saturdays and Sundays. Now, up until the interview on the 31st of October, had you been told anything, whether it was by Mr. Podesta or whether it was by Ms. Watkins after she um, purport, I assume reported to you that she would, had set things up with Ms. Lewinsky or anyone else, that there were any kind of time constraints or time pressures in terms of interviewing and or hiring Ms. Lewinsky? No, no, not at all. What's your first recollection of how you were told, if at all, that you were going to be interviewing Ms. Lewinsky on Halloween morning, the 31st? Um, it could... What I think, what, we, what usually happens is I like to get, I don't deal with the schedule of the next day until late the night before, when I insist on a little card or an explanation of the next day schedule. Um, what usually happens is Mona Sutman tells me what we're going to do the next day. And I think what happened was the first time I knew about meeting Lewinsky on Friday, was on the plane coming down from, in the shuttle from New York, um, Mona telling me, you know, we, we got an interview tomorrow with Lewinsky. You're meeting this Lewinsky woman tomorrow at 7.30. And, and let me also state for the record, because this has been a source of confusion. Can I do this? Can I? Absolutely. I met with Miss Lewinsky not for breakfast. She, she was not, <laughs> she didn't have breakfast. I had breakfast earlier. We met in my suite at the Watergate Hotel, which is not a permanent suite, where I frequently have other meetings. I did not meet with her in her apartment. I had no idea she lived at the Watergate. And I want to stress that uh, it was not a breakfast. It was an interview attended by myself, Miss Sutman, and Rebecca Cooper. Okay. So. Ms. Sutman and Rebecca Cooper were the persons who were present, correct? Yes. yes. Um, tell us about the interview. What, were, what was discussed? Well, the, uh, I remember that uh, either Mona or Rebecca went downstairs to get her and uh, started meeting at 7.30. I think I'd already had breakfast. I was, the meeting lasted about 45 minutes. I believe I was there uh, listening while Mona and Rebecca were interviewing her. And then I came in, I think at the end, to ask uh, some questions. But I was always listening. I was packing. I was on the phone. The way the structure of the room is, you've got the bedroom, <coughs> and then you've got the little um, sofas. So you can see what each is doing. 
So I was hearing, but the, the, most of the interview was conducted by Moan and Rebecca. And do you remember the topics that were discussed with her? Well, yeah. Uh, Rebecca Cooper, my new chief of staff, wanted to establish a new outreach position. Uh, she uh, asked uh, Lewinsky about her background. Uh, I remember Cooper was particularly interested in Lewinsky's experience with the Internet, with uh, her, her ability, her, uh, this new outreach position uh, was designed to improve the image of the United Nations in the country, especially with the Congress public information, public affairs related, and uh, Cooper felt very strongly that we needed this beefing up of our capability in New York, that we needed uh, strength there in this area, that we had a press office in New York that mainly did just public information, but that we needed more outreach. We needed somebody that could uh, deal with organizations, with uh, selling the United Nations and convincing the public of the merits of the United Nations. That, that was the job that uh, she had envisioned, uh, advance also. I had also, uh, looking at her resume, I looked at her resume, I recall, and saw that this is a young woman who had been promoted. She'd been in the White House, uh, legislative affairs. She worked uh, at the Department of Defense. Uh, I remember her saying she worked for Bacon, uh, she did advance for Cohen, she traveled with the Secretary of Defense. Um, she did, she, she said, I remember in the interview, she said she did the news summaries for Cohen when he did press conferences overseas, or she compiled something. Um, she was impressive in the interview. Um, she seemed uh, poised, professional, and, uh, and I must say, after the interview, I, I was impressed with her. Now, you mentioned there was talk about some of the things going on at the Pentagon. Do you know whether or not either you or Ms. Cooper or Ms. Uh, Sutphin asked her about her work at the Pentagon? I mean, was that something you yeah. asked about? I think Cooper asked her about what she did at the Pentagon and, and Mona did. And, and I, I mean, she told me what she did with Bacon and, and she did with, uh, she traveled with the Secretary of Defense. And she was, at the time, was planning on a trip they were going to Asia or something. I remember her saying that. Did you or anyone ask her about any of her work at the White House? Uh, no, I, I didn't. I just noticed that she'd worked in the Congressional Relations Office. And, and I must say, I was impressed okay. as somebody that <laughs> was in the Congress. Um, why didn't you ask her anything about the White House? Well, uh, her last job was at the Pentagon. Uh, you know, what happens in, when you hire somebody is references are checked by the State Department security people um, and questions relating to, you know, her, her uh, references and others are, are done by them. I mean, I, I, I can uh, get a judgment of the person and, and I was impressed. As I said, I interview everybody that is a serious applicant for a position with me. And um, this, is, this is how I do things. Okay, now this outreach program, so is it accurate then that at the time you interviewed her, the job that you potentially had in mind was some sort of an outreach position that would be made in New York? Yes. Okay. Did anyone occupy that position up until that point? No, because it was a slot that we hadn't filled. And this was a slot that Gina Griego had, and she had left. And what we wanted to do was shift this position to New York, the slot, and find a way through the personnel system that we could make it, quote, the outreach position. And Gina Griego then had done the, the position in Washington? Uh, not to that extent. She had been sort of an administrative assistant type. You know, when Cooper came in, she rightly pointed out that we needed more of an outreach to the public to sell the UN, and, and I went along with that. And, and I was trusting her judgment on specifically this position. Now, when you say this was a job that was open, were there any kind of uh, job notice, notices that were passed out I stating this thing as a position? 
I don't know, but I, but I think we had other applicants or other people that you know we we had in the mix. Um, but I don't think no. I mean, there's no notice for these things. I don't think. Well, is it your experience in government that there typically are notices posted for government jobs? Yeah, but not all political jobs. Political jobs, uh, that is usually not the case. I think uh, C, uh, Schedule C appointments, political appointments, I don't believe they're necessarily posted. Was this a Schedule C appointment in your mind? I think it is a Schedule C. Uh, I think Gina had a C, yeah. Now, you indicate that there were other people in the mix. How long had you been considering applicants for this particular position? I think not very long. At the time, we were really starting to get enmeshed in the Iraq crisis. This was not very much on my radar screen. I mean, we were going day to day, 20 hours a day. This personnel matter was not big on my radar screen. And uh, Cooper, I think, had talked to some other people. And I, and, and I, don't, I don't remember necessarily that I had said, well, this is somebody I'm considering for uh, for Gina's job. Although I had, as I said, I think I saw four or five people during that time period uh, that that might have been uh, candidates for this. I, I just don't remember. I mean, this was a and big period of intensity with the Iraq issue. Okay. So you don't have any recollection then as to whether you would have interviewed any people for this particular position you were considering for Ms. Lewinsky. Is that Th that's probably right. Okay. Yeah. Can you, one request I would make is can you confer with your counsel um, after we're done, and then to the degree that you have get information relating to other applicants that you interviewed for what could be this position, would you provide that to sure. the independent counsel's yeah. office? Yes. Okay. Yeah. And is it fair then, for purposes of the record, that unless that, that I still, personally interviewed, or that yes, sir, Cooper that, interviewed? That you personally interviewed. Well, actually, I guess I'd ask for both. Okay. That Cooper interviewed, and then also any, and would want it designated whether you personally interviewed them, okay? And is it acceptable to you for purposes of the record that we will assume for purposes of the grand jury proceeding that unless and until we get such information from you that it doesn't exist? That's right, yeah. Now, what was said at the um, end of this interview? How did you leave it with Ms. Lewinsky? Um, I think I t we told her or, uh, that we would get back to her. Uh, there was no, you know, no offer made, nothing. We, we, we'd get back to it, that I'd think about it. Okay. Now, did, um, after the interview, who if I... But in, do you recall any time during the interview, did Ms. Lewinsky um, express an special interest in the United Nations, or did she indicate that she may also have interest in other positions? No, she, uh, well, the, the answer is both. She, she had done her homework about the UN, about me, that she wanted to, uh, she said she was moving to New York. Uh, she did say she was also looking at the private sector. But she did, uh, she'd done her homework. She, she was uh, impressive in her presentation, as I said, in her poise. Um, and, and as I said, in, in her background, looking at her background, uh, for a public affairs job, she'd done public affairs at the White House, she'd done public affairs at the Department of Defense. We had a junior job open, um, and, and it seemed uh, after the interview that I, I was suitably impressed. Did Ms. Lewinsky indicate um, how she was going about, and this was during the interview with you on the 31st, did she make any reference to or give any suggestion as to how she was going about looking into private sector jobs in New York? No. You mentioned um, when you were talking about why you were impressed with Ms. Lewinsky that she had, quote, been promoted, unquote. What promotion are you referring to? Well, I'm simply saying that she went from the White House to the Department of Defense from a staff position uh, to director of legislative correspondence to Ken Bacon's assistant. I mean, this is a better job. Better job. And so you view that as a promotion? Yeah. yeah. Did you ever make any inquiries, either, if not before the interview, Because she was 
hanging around the Oval Office or where the President was too much. No. Now, you said that it was your understanding that you would just or strike that. I believe you told us that you would typically get your own impression of people, but that you would assume that the State Department would check out references and things of that nature? Right. Uh, walk us through how that works. Uh, when you interview an applicant and assuming that uh, you feel like, based on the personal impression, you like the applicant, what's your understanding of the procedure? How does the applicant and or resume and information get to the State Department so they can then follow up? Well, what, what usually happens is um, we, we, hit ex we extend an offer to somebody and then we make it very clear that there has to be a, a satisfactory security clearance reference. Um, usually what I would then do is send them to some of the personnel people on my team. And the State Department security, uh, which is, involves the FBI also, is very, you know, very thorough in their, uh, in their uh, searches for people. So I, I don't, s I get a gut instinct about somebody, I, I want to hire them. Uh, I, I extend an offer and then, you know, there's a problem and surfaces in the, in the checks. So with your procedure, the checks as far as references and things like that would typically occur after you yeah. extend the offer. That's right. Yeah. Did you extend an offer to Ms. Lewinsky um, at the time of her interview? No. no. After the interview, did you have any discussions with anybody about Ms. Lewinsky and what you thought of her and what should be done? Yeah, I remember, I think in the car, as we went to see Ben Gilman, or in the cars as we went to see these other members of Congress, uh, I asked uh, Rebecca and Mona that were in the car, I said, well, what did you guys think? And Mona said, I'm impressed. And uh, Cooper said, I'm, uh, I'm impressed, I think we should hire her. And I said, well, let me think about it. Let's, let's put it on. Now, this would have been on a Friday. Obviously, October 31st. Yeah, I think it was right, right after, you know, we, we jumped in the car. And then the next working day then, if we say the 31st was um, Friday, so that means the first was Saturday, the second was Sunday, and then the third would have been the next working day on a Monday, correct? Yeah. I'm going to place in front of you, we want to do these next two exhibits, which are going to be... Uh, Make sure we get the right ones here. Do you not, um, you don't have that exam? Okay. Okay. So I'm going to give you two exhibits. Actually, I'll give them to the court reporter. But we'll make the next two in order. Okay. Actually, why don't we hold off with those for just a second, because I do want to check one other exhibit first. Okay. Yeah, actually, let's go ahead with a, another exhibit first, which we'll take out of order, but we can have that one next. Okay. Now, I'd ask if you look at what number do we have on that one? It's Exhibit 7, and directing your attention to, um, I'll represent to you, sir, this is a document that was taken off of the computer of Monica Lewinsky. And if you look at the top of the page, it says, to November 1997, and it says, Dear Betty. And then if you look at the second paragraph, yeah. and I'm going to read that aloud, it says, I became a bit nervous this weekend when I realized that Ambassador Richardson said his staff would be in touch with me this, and it's italicized, week. Yeah. As you know, the UN is supposed to be my backup, but because VJ has been out of town, it's my only option right now. Who's VJ? Um, well, I was going to ask you that, but oh. <laughs> let's just continue here. Okay. Um, what should I say to Richardson's people this week when they call? And then it, you can read the rest of that paragraph if you'd like. And then I'll also direct you to the very last full paragraph, which also has a reference to you. And if you can just look at that. And I'll the last one? Um, the one that's a few, the, read that second paragraph, and then I guess it's the, the sixth paragraph have references to your name. And ma'am, what's the number of this one? Thanks. 
guess she's not looking forward to <laughs> coming. And, and by that, are you referring to the, to the yuck. portion that says, yuck. I'm mailing my thank you for meeting with me letter to Richardson today. I was pleased that you on interview went well, but I'm afraid it would be like being in the P Pentagon in New York. Yuck, please let me know what to do, sir. Do you see that, sir? Yeah. Okay. Let me go back up and just ask you, is it accurate, sir, that during the interview, first of all, let's start over. Let's look at timing. The interview obviously was on Friday the 31st, correct? Yeah. Okay. And so to the degree that the date on this is accurate, which I'm not necessarily representing that it is, right. but November 2nd, which would have been a Sunday, right. when it refers in paragraph um, two about becoming nervous this weekend, when I realized that Ambassador, Ambassador Richardson said his staff would be in touch with me this week, right. that is the weekend that you would have interviewed her, correct? Namely, the Friday the 31st was the weekend of the same weekend as November 2nd. Correct? Who would be in touch with me this week, in other words, the, ne the next week. Right, I'm looking, I guess there's two components to this at least literally, if we look at the first line of paragraph two, I became a bit nervous this weekend oh, I when I realized that Ambassador Richardson, so let's focus on that part. Okay. Do you agree with me, sir, that at least based on the calendar, this weekend would be the weekend of the 31st, 1st, and 2nd? Yeah. And the 31st. After the meeting. Correct. Yeah. Um, did you indicate to Ms. Lewinsky that someone from your staff would be in touch with her this week? I don't think so. I, said, I, I think we said we'll be back in touch. Um, you do believe that there was some reference to getting in touch with her, but you don't believe that there was any time frame? Yeah, on I don't think there was a time frame. Okay. But um, you need to ask Mona, uh, uh, but, but I don't think there, I don't believe there was a time frame. If you look at that second paragraph, I guess it would be the fourth sentence that says, I had mentioned to Richardson that working there, I'm assuming meaning the UN, was one emphasized of the things I was looking at. Do you see that, sir? Mm -hmm. uh, did she indicate to you that working at the UN was one of the things she was considering? Yeah, but she said that she was looking at the private sector also. Okay. That's all the questions I have on that document. Did you have any more, Mr. Larry? <laughs> right. You asked who's VJ. Do you know who VJ is? No. Okay. Who's now, if we go to the next two documents that the court reporter had prepared, and why don't we start with WBR 5. Do you have a copy of WBR 5? I'm going to, if you don't mind, why don't you read it, but I'm going to have you lay it down because that's my copy. Oh, we have an extra copy, so. Yes. And I'm going to direct your attention to the highlighted paragraph, which would be the second paragraph. And I will represent to you, sir, that this is a, an email that we received from a witness in the grand jury who testified that this was an email that she received. This one? This entire document here. Yes, sir. But I'll represent to you that this is an email that a witness testified in the grand jury was received from Monica Lewinsky on or about November 5th in the Far East, which would have been November 4th. She was in, in the United Far States. East. Yes. Ms. Lewinsky was here, according to the witness. The witness who got the email was in the Far East, which means the date based on this document at, time, at the time Ms. Lewinsky would have sent it would have been November 4th, which I believe would, if we use our... November 5th, huh? Correct. In fact, one of the things I'm going to do, since we're talking about a lot of days, how about I do this to make it easier? I'm going to put out just a blank calendar. Mr. Lerner was good enough to provide for us for the month of November 1997 so we can help get our days straight. And do you agree with me, sir, that November 3rd was a Monday? Yeah. And then, then November 4th was a Tuesday, correct? Right. So November 3rd would have been the first day back, at least the first work day back, after you interviewed Ms. Lewinsky on Friday, October 31st. Right. All right. Now, if you can direct your attention to the second paragraph of the email. And I'm going to read it aloud, and then I'll ask you some questions about it. Okay, sir? Is that okay? Yeah, yeah. It indicates, the job thing on Friday went much better than expected. It was nice. The big creep called Thursday night and gave me a pep talk because I was so afraid I'd sound like an idiot. 
Richardson is a great guy, and I met two women who worked for him, also very cool. Yesterday, Richardson called me at work and told me they were going to offer me a position. They didn't know what yet, and they wanted to talk with me further. Now, I'm going to go ahead and let's just stop right there, sir, and I'll ask you some questions. First of all, is it accurate that she did interview with you on Friday, and that would be the Friday immediately before November 5th? Yes. Yeah. And obviously your name is Richardson, which appears in this email, correct? Mm -hmm. And is it also accurate, sir, that when you interviewed with her, um, there were two women who worked for you present at the interview? Yes. Yeah. And that would have been Miss Sutphin and Miss Cooper. Ms. Cooper. And I'd also direct your attention, sir, to the next exhibit given to you. Oh, I'm sorry, the court reporter has it, which is um, WBR6. And, sir, if you look at the highlighted with the yellow market portion, which is about halfway down the page, I'll represent to you this is another phone record that we got via subpoena. And it shows an entry that says Richardson, William Richardson, extension it has a date of november 3rd 1997 it shows that there was a phone call at 11:02 a.m that lasted two minutes and 54 seconds and that went to do you see that sir yeah now i'll represent to you sir that that phone number is monica lewinsky's pentagon office number okay right. and let's go through the details of this once again that is, in fact, the extension of the phone in your office, correct? Right, right. And 11397, if we look at our um, calendar, that would be the Monday, the first working day back after you interviewed Ms. Lewinsky, correct? Um, that's Monday. Correct. Right, and you right. interviewed her on Friday the 31st, correct? Right. So do you agree with me, sir, that this indicates, at least the reference here, would be November 3rd, the Monday, the first day back, correct? Yes. And that the phone record that we're looking at is on that day, Monday the 3rd, correct? Right. And that it indicates that a phone call was made at 11 in the morning from your phone extension, namely number Right. That lasted 2 minutes and 54 seconds to right. Monica Lewinsky's work number. Right. Okay, sir, is it accurate that you did call her on that day I, and, you, and you offered her a position? Uh, I need to talk to my counsel. That's fine. I need to go to the men's room. Come That's on. fine. Be off the record 110844. Back on the record 111341. And uh, Ambassador Richardson, if it's all right with you, as I understand it, your attorney called for some water for us that they're bringing, but if we can just start and yeah, then yeah. we'll stop though when the water comes until yeah, yeah. they go in and out. And okay. Now, the question that I'd ask before the break, sir, is it accurate that you called Ms. Lewinsky on Monday, November 3rd, and you had told her you were going to offer her a position? No. That is uh, a, the same situation that is my extension, but I do not believe I talked by phone at all with Monica Lewinsky. I don't believe I talked to her before or after. That is not my... Uh, that is not my recollection whatsoever. Is it your testimony, sir, that there was never any time when you've spoken on a telephone with Monica Lewinsky? I, I believe that's the case, that there was never a time. Now, there is, at some point, I did tell Mona Sutman to call her and offer her the position, but it was Mona Sutman, not okay. I didn't do it. And let me go through something with you, sir, and you tell me if any of this is accurate. Um, and I'm going to represent that this is something that Ms. Lewinsky stated on one of the taped conversations. And I want to know from you whether any of this is accurate. She indicated that your assistant placed the call, and then Richardson got on the phone and told her, Lewinsky, that they were offering her a position, but that he, meaning you, and Mona had to meet with her, Monica Lewinsky, this week because you, Ambassador Richardson, and Mona would be in D.C. that week. First of all, um, this is before the interview? No, sir. This would be in reference to November 3rd. No, November 3rd, no. no. I, I would not meet her again. 
do you know whether or not you were going to be in Washington the week of November 3rd? Well, I almost for sure I'd be in Washington one of the days of the week. But my procedure would have been, I would have asked Mona Sutman to contact her if we had decided to offer her the job. But it wouldn't require a second meeting. And we'll go off the record while yeah. some water is being... Go off the record, 11 Back on the record, 11 35 Would you have, if you had not done it personally, would you have directed Ms. Sutphin or anyone else in your office on or about November 3rd to contact Ms. Lewinsky, indicate to her that you were offering her a position and that you were hoping that, uh, first of all, let's take it a step at a time, would you have, in, have, would you have directed anyone like Mona Sutphin to contact Monica Lewinsky on or about November 3rd and offer her a position? I don't think so. I think that... Um, it took me about a week or 10 days to decide this. So, no, I don't believe that Monday I would have said, offer her the job. And, um, and so I'm going to go through the rest of the details of this conversation, and I'll just ask them to you in two stages. One, did you, and did you personally tell Ms. Lewinsky that in a call on or about the third? And then secondly, did you authorize anyone else to do the same, just for our record, okay? And the other statements on here... Um, did you indicate to Ms. Lewinsky in a telephone call on or about November 3rd, or, and let's say give or take several days, that you didn't know exactly what position you would offer her, but you were going to offer her some position? No. I believe that it, 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 it was, I would not do that. My executive assistant would do that. Right. And, the, and the conversation that I'm referring to on the tape continues with Ms. Lewinsky indicating, and then Ambassador Richardson said, how do you want me to work this? Do you want me to tell Ken Bacon? And Ms. Lewinsky indicated she said no, that she'd take care of telling Ken Bacon. Did you ever have a conversation with Ms. Lewinsky when you asked her, or words to the effect, whether you should inform Ken Bacon that you were going to hire her? No. Okay. Yeah. And obviously, I'm assuming by that, uh, your testimony would be she never indicated to you that she'd do the same. Right. Correct. And Ms. Lewinsky further indicates that during this purported call, you indicated to her that you'd be calling Bob Nash. Did you ever indicate to Ms. Lewinsky in a conversation you had with her that you would call Bob Nash? No. Okay. Did you ever direct Mona Sutphin to contact Ms. Lewinsky and inform her that she had the position and that um, she would be contacting either she or you would be contacting Ken Bacon? No. What I did was I told Mona Sutman, I think about 10 days afterwards, after I had taken in Rebecca Cooper's very strong recommendation that we hire Nowinski, um, I decided some 10 days later, I think, or a week later, it was not immediate, it, this was not on my radar screen, that I should offer her uh, a position. And I had Mona Sutman call Monica to talk to her and offer her the position. And I believe Mona did. I, I think the records would show that. Now, let me go to the next exhibit. Do you have any other questions on this? Okay. We go to the next exhibit. We'll give that to the court reporter. And, and ma'am, is that um, number nine? Eight. Okay. WBR eight. And ask her if you look at that. Now tell me, sir, if you recognize what WBR eight is. Yeah, this is this is the thank you letter. She said. Uh, by that, you mean you mean that this is a thank you letter that you would have received from Ms. Lewinsky, um, thanking you for meeting with her last Friday morning, which would be October thirty first. Correct. Yeah, but I could have seen this November tenth. I mean, this is November 3rd. Uh, well, I don't know, was it mailed or fax? Looks like it was mailed. So I may have seen this, you know, two weeks later, 10 days later. Is now, this a fax? Do we know? I, I'm not sure. I mean, the copy that I have is like yours. No, it looks see. like correspondence. Right. And, um, well, I think that number at the bottom might be a number either that you put on it or we put on it. 
based on production of, on a subpoena. So I don't know that that's something you would normally do. Okay. Um, now, and just for the record, let me indicate that what this letter says is, it's dated November 3rd, it says it was a pleasure meeting with you last Friday morning. I know how very busy and demanding your schedule is. I particularly appreciated your taking the time to speak with me. Right. Then says it was an honor to meet with you. The U.S. mission to the United Nations is certainly in good hands with you at the helm. Again, thank you for your time, and then it says sincerely, Monica Lewinsky, correct? Right. Now, first of all, there's a reference here in the first sentence to it was a pre pleasure meeting with you last Friday morning. Right. And again, based on the date at the top, would you agree that that appears to refer to October 31st? Yes. All right. Now, at the top right of the page, there's some writing on the right-hand side in pen, or we'll look at a copy, but what would appear to be pen that says, Mona, what does this mean? Do you yeah. see that? Yeah. Whose writing is that? That's mine. Okay. And that would be a note that you wrote on top of this document upon seeing it, correct? Yes. And then at the bottom, there's another written portion, the bottom right, that says BR dash she wrote this note before we spoke last week. Right. Just a thank you. Do you yeah. see that? Yeah. Okay. Now, do you under, can you tell us what that exchange is a reference to? Yeah. I, I believe what it is is that I received this. She wrote this letter November 3rd. I may have gotten it a week later um, or 10 days later. I think I had already told Mona, Mona, offer her the job. And Mona... And so I write this note, Mona, what does this mean? Uh, and is that because, in your mind, if you knew you'd, she had already been offered the job, this letter seems rather yeah, vague in terms of why she's taking the know, job? What does this mean? And then, and then Mona, I guess, right, she wrote this note before we spoke last week. So, just to thank you. This shows that this, this letter, we must have gotten it about November 10th or 15th or, you know, certainly couldn't have spoken to her the week before she wrote the letter, so. Okay, now when it says she wrote this note before we spoke last week, what's your understanding of who Mona, the, the we spoke as a reference to, I know? Um, I think it refers to her, Mona and Lewinsky. Okay. About the job offer? Yeah. Okay. So, and tell me if this is accurate then. The basis for your being somewhat confused about the letter is the fact that you knew at whatever time that you were looking at it that a job offer had been extended yeah. and in light of the fact that you were waiting to learn whether she was accepting a job offer this letter didn't really address the issue and was sort of confusing in terms of does it mean she's taking the job or not that's right and then the reference to or i should say the note to you from mona is basically explaining why the letter is kind of strange yeah. namely she's saying this is a letter she wrote uh, before we, namely Mona and Monica, spoke about the job offer last week. Right, okay. right. So is it also then accurate that at least based on its terms, that whatever time it was that you saw the letter, Mona would have given the job offer to Monica Lewinsky the week before? Well, I don't know if it was the week before, but yeah, before this letter came to us because when I got this letter it's sort of a nebulous letter and I, I'm wondering well what's what's the story here what, why is she sending this letter and I do that frequently I, I put little notations why why am I getting this why is this coming to me what does this mean I mean I do that frequently okay now whenever it was that the job was offered to Ms. Lewinsky and and just to kind of bracket that time um, as I understand your testimony, you do believe that it was probably conveyed, um, you don't believe it was as early as November 3rd as, right. as these documents, right. at least the email and, the, and there's a phone record of a call on November 3rd. You do not believe that it would have been that early, correct? That's right. And, but you do believe it could have been roughly 10 or 11 days after the interview. Or a week, 10 to 11 days, yeah. Which would put us in the time frame of, say, November 8th to 11th, correct? Possibly, yeah. Okay. But you're... It, you're, I, you're asking me about something that was not on my radar screen. I mean, you, this was a very intensive period. Monica Lewinsky was far from my mind when 
in trying to answer these questions. I mean, you, you understand that. Now, whenever it was that you and Ms. Sutphin had the discussion, strike that, who was it that you had the discussion with in which you indicated, I am, I do intend to offer her a position? It was Mona, just Mona and myself. Okay, and what was it that you told uh, Mona as best, as best you can recall? Um, I think it was, uh, Mona, I think uh, we ought to go with, uh, I want to go with Lewinsky, why don't you call her? I think it was something to that effect. And what specifically was the position that you and Mona planned to offer? Well, the position was, uh, a slot previously held by Gina Griego that would deal with outreach. It would be based in New York, and it would involve uh, making sure that our personnel system uh, made the adjustment. Is this a good time to let you change the tapes? Sir? Certainly. Is that okay with you? Yeah. Yes. Be off the record at 11:27:18. We're back on the record 112913. This is videotape number two and a continuing interview with uh, Ambassador William Richardson, an NRA investigation by the Office of the Special Counsel. Can I start? And just uh, for the record, during the um, short break, you were looking at some of the exhibits in front of you, and I think you indicated you wanted to make a comment. Well, yeah, I just wanted to make a comment here um, about this note from Lewinsky to Betty. I realize that Ambassador Richardson said his staff would be in touch with me this week. I think that's probably accurate. That <coughs> said that to her. Meaning we, during the interview? Yeah, that we'd be back in touch with her, that the staff would be back in touch with her. I don't think I said this week. I just wanted to point that out. Okay. Any, anything further on that, sir? No. Okay, you can go ahead and set some of those aside okay. if you want, just so they're not in your way as much. Yes, sir. Can I just one more question about this? <coughs> and for the record, we're looking at WBR 8, which is the thank you letter. Right. Um, there you go. It's my experience that if I send a letter from Washington to New York, it takes a few days. So is that your experience? Yeah. yeah. So if I were to send a, a letter November 3rd, it probably would be received, say, November 6th, on, on average, obviously. Yeah, and then it'll get processed by my staff, so it could be a few more days. Oh, so it could be a few more days after a letter is received that you would actually see it? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, and you would say that uh, seven to ten days after the interview, which was the 31st, you would think that Mona Sutphin placed a call broaching the issue of the job. I think but, so, yeah. Um, That's how I recall. Right. Um, the fact that there are no phone calls in that period um, between Mona Sutphin and, and Monica Lewinsky, does that suggest that that memory might be inaccurate? Well, I, I don't know. What is, what are the phone, when, when does it indicate she called her? There's a later phone call, but nothing in the, 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 the period that you're suggesting. Well, what, two weeks? Uh, there's a call. In fact, let's some, I think on. we have it. 11-19. Well, it was 11-14. Let's see. So two weeks? Well, this is... Is this, uh... We we're going to get to that. Okay. Uh, okay, so the progression of calls, and, and I think we are, it's not like we're holding out any calls. That yeah, we, no, no, calls no, no, no. We're, we had the call that we show from, your, from Extension right. on November 3rd. Right. Then we have another call um, that we have from, we Ms. Wanna, from Ms. Lewinsky. <coughs> from Ms. Lewinsky's Pentagon office, and if we might as well pass that over now. And that's going to be WBR 9. And that call, let's go ahead and hand that to. Well, I just want to stress that the calls does not mean that I make the call. I mean, we've established that, right? Correct. Have, well, you said that's, that's I've said that. Yeah. Then we have WBR 9, which has just been placed in front of you. And if you look at the bottom of the page, we've highlighted a call. Right. And that's a call 
This is from Ms. Lewinsky's Pentagon office right. to right. which is your extension, or at least the number assigned to your extension. When? On 14, November 14th. It was a one minute and 41 second call at, it looks like, 2.50 in the afternoon. Do you right. see that, sir? Yeah. So that would have been the next call that we show. Right. And then we'll show you, as we go along, any other calls that we have. I think the, the next call that we show would have been on November 19th. So that's really the timing. This and is that one her calling it. us. Right. And then the call on November 19th, which I guess we'll give you now so we can get through them, which we'll call WBR 10. And if you look at that, um, this is another copy of the page you saw earlier, actually, but just highlighted differently. Right. WBR 10 shows the one, two, three, four, fifth call at the bottom yeah. is a November 19th call from the extension assigned to Mona Kai Sutphin right. to which is Ms. Lewinsky's Watergate residence address. Right. So that's the series of calls that we show. <coughs> at least up through that part of November. And why don't we show you the next call just so we've completed all the November calls we have. Right. <coughs> Excuse me. Which we'll call WBR 11. And that's the court reporter. WBR 11, sir, is a phone record. If you look at the highlighted portion indicating a call, this, all of these calls are from Ms. Lewinsky's Pentagon phone number right. to, which again is Ms. Sutphin's extension, a six minute call on November 24th at 10.14 in the morning. Okay. So that I guess then to summarize, the progression of calls that we show in the month of November is we have the November 3 call from extension to Ms. Lewinsky. Right. We then have the November 14th call right. from Ms. Lewinsky's Pentagon extension to extension your extension. When, when is that? The That's um, November 14th. Okay. We then have a November 19th call from Ms. Sutphin's extension to Ms. Lewinsky's home address, or I should say home phone number in Washington. Right. And then finally in the month of November, we have the, I think it was on the 24th, the November 24th call from Ms. Lewinsky's work number at the Pentagon to Ms. Sutphin. Okay. All right. Now, <coughs> Let's go back to when you would have had the discussion with Ms. Sutphin, right. indicating to her that you were inclined or were going to direct her to offer a job to Ms. Lewinsky, okay? Or stated differently, the conversation you had with Ms. Sutphin when you indicated your intention to offer a job to Ms. Lewinsky. Right. Okay? Um, in that conversation, is it accurate that Ms. Sutphin told you at that point um, words the effect of, are you sure you don't want to interview any other people? I don't remember that. If Ms. Sutphin told investigators at the independent councils when interviewed that that is what she said to you, um, do you believe that it was said? Do you adamantly believe it was not said? Or do you no, she might have said it. Yeah. In any event, is it accurate that at whatever time that conversation was had, you had concluded that you weren't going to interview other people, but you were going to hire Ms. Yeah, Lewinsky? Yeah, I think I got a good sense of Lewinsky. I thought it was time to move on. Yeah. Now, let's talk a little bit about the position. You, I think you described a little while ago that she was taking the position of uh, another lady. Regina was, Griego. Okay. Regina Griego had been in Washington, correct? Yeah. And that this was a... She was taking the slot. I mean, we, we were going to redefine the position to do more outreach, uh, to do public affairs, to do advance. So, I mean, I want that established. Rebecca Cooper had wanted that, and I had agreed with that. 
And when Rebecca Cooper, after we interviewed Lewinsky, uh, told me, I think she's the best one, I like her, I uh, took that very much into account. But it was ultimately my decision. So she took a, a slot, namely she became an employee after Ms. Griego had uh, terminated her employment um, right. with your office. In no, Washington, we, had, we had a slot. But the jobs were different. The jobs ultimately would be different, yeah. and they would. And but the salary would be basically the same. So it would be a similar salary. It would have different responsibilities. Different responsibilities. And it would be located in a different city, New York, yes. as opposed to Washington. Yes. And is it accurate, sir, that you did not interview anyone else for that slot slash position, whatever we want to call it? We had other employees. Uh, that were interested in working closer with me. A man by the name of Paul Aronson, who Cooper also liked, who was working in the political <coughs> section at the mission, and who Cooper also told me uh, she was, he was somebody that she would like to work under, him, under her. Uh, but we also, what happens is I have a pool of people that I talk to in terms of uh, applications. And I remember somebody that I'm impressed with. This is why I'm constantly interviewing people. So I don't think it's fair to say that uh, Lewinsky was the only person I interviewed. I, I think there were other people that I had in mind that I could have moved to any one of any slots that I have. Slots at the US UN are constantly happening because people move on, the pay isn't that good, especially in the press and public affairs area. <coughs> the position that Ms. Lewinsky would have, uh, that you envisioned for Ms. Lewinsky would not have been working under Ms. Cooper, correct? She would have been, yeah, she, uh, Coop, yeah. Uh, she would have had the position that Paul Arison has right now, and she would have been supervised by Ms. Cooper, yeah. Well, Ms. Cooper runs the Washington office, correct? That's right. Yeah. Ms. Lewinsky was going to be based in New York, correct? She's going to be based in New York. Um, now, Mr. Aronson, where does he work? He's in New York. In New York. How long after, um, strike that, when was the position filled by Mr. Aronson? Um, February, March. What month? Uh, uh, February, March, I think. And and what's exactly his title? Is this, is this, does he do exactly what you described, namely with the outreach program? Yeah, yeah. And he works under Cooper. Just because she works here in Washington doesn't mean she doesn't supervise other people in New York. She does. Had, I'm sorry. Had he been in the New York office before, or was he in Washington? No, he was in the New York office. Was he under consideration for this position at the time that you determined to make the offer to Ms. Lewinsky? Um, I don't know. I mean, I, I don't know what Cooper was thinking of. I, I kind of left that position up to her. You, you know, you may want to ask her. But she liked this guy. Uh, he is good. And she wanted to sort of put him under her aegis. That was what she was trying to do. Now, whenever it was that you um, decided to make the offer to Ms. Lewinsky and however it was conveyed, did you have in mind um, any time parameters within which um, you would want her to take the job? As I recall, I told Mona, I said, offer her the job. And, you know, we were starting to get in the midst of a very intense period on Iraq. A lot of other things that were pending were put on the shelf. Um, I recall Mona coming back to me and saying, well, uh, Lewinsky has asked for a little time to think about it. Um, she appreciates the offer. Uh, she wants to think about it. And so I said, all right, well. And then we had a rock. And uh, at one point, I recall uh, in December, uh, Cooper came to me and said, well, you know, there's some problem with the slot. You know, we're the, 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 the civil service, uh, I'm, I'm having difficulty shifting it from 
Washington to New York. And, and you know, we're, we, you may have to intervene and, and fix it. And I think that triggered in my mind uh, during this very intense period with Iraq, uh, with Mona Suppen. I said, Mona, wh what's happened with Lewinsky? She said, well, she's, you know, she's, uh, right now, she said she wanted more time to think about it. I said, well, the hell with this. We got to get moving. Tell her to fish or cut bait. Tell her that, you know, we have to move on. Tell her, does she want the job or not? And Mona, I think, did that. Uh, th I think this was right before the holidays, and, and shortly thereafter, she informed me that Lewinsky had, uh, was looking for things in the private sector, and she wouldn't be taking the job. Yeah. But I told Lewinsky, I told, I told Mona, tell her to fish or cut bait, and I think what triggered it was, was a discussion with Cooper telling me, well, you know, this position that we want to do, it's not that easy to shift the job from uh, Washington to New York, and I've talked to Wayne, and so I think Wayne uh, Lodgson, my administrative guy, was explaining uh, what had to be done for that to happen, because I wanted to keep that slot as a political slot, that I could name the person, um, and, and I didn't want to get it into a complicated personnel situation. So I wanted it fixed, and it wasn't fixed, and so for that reason, it triggered in my mind, well, whatever happened to to Lewinsky in this job. And that's when I told Mona, tell her to fish or cut bait. Is she coming with us or not? I mean, we can, we can only wait so long. I think we'd waited about a month or so. Is this sometime, you said something before the holidays. You mean the Christmas holidays? Yeah. So this is mid-December. Yeah, close to the holidays, yeah. Now, let's kind of focus on the time, you know, in the time between whenever the job offer was extended sometime between the interview up until, you know, let's say November 10th, 11th, 12th, whatever the time frame was in there, through the time that you believe was close to the Christmas holidays when you basically told Ms. Sutfo, <coughs> you go ahead, get in touch with uh, Ms. Lewinsky about fishing or cut bait. Do you know, um, as we've seen, there were some calls back and forth, as you can see from the phone records, correct? Yeah. Um, do you have any recollection of whether or not Ms. Sutfer or anyone else was sort of updating you other than that original time when an offer was made and that final time when you said to, her, to Ms. Sutfer, tell Lewinsky to fish or cut bait, do you believe that you got any reports like, well, I heard from Monica again, she still wants more time or she's still trying to figure this out or anything along those lines? Well, yeah, I, Mona did tell me. She said, at one point, she said she wants more time. She wants us to... To, she wants time to think about it. I think this is what she said. So that would have been one update that, and, and Mona may have been trying to reach her to ask her that. Um, and then Mona updated me. But at the time, I remember talking to Mona before the final call came in from Lewinsky saying she wasn't going to do this. And Mona was already hinting. She, she kind of said, I don't think she, she, she wants to take this job. I think she wants to go in the private sector. I don't think she's terribly interested in this job. This is Mona's impression. But what triggered it was the problem with a personnel system right before the Christmas holidays. Uh, I said, well, tell her to fish or cut bait. I'm not going to wait around forever. The hell with this thing. Now, um, I'm assuming that getting a job uh, with the ambassador of the UN, the kind of job you were talking about considering Ms. Lewinsky for, those jobs are pretty much in demand, correct? Right? Well, yeah, they're in demand, but not terribly in demand. I mean, is it accurate that you typically get um, a good many more applicants for any position than you ultimately fill? Yeah, yeah, but it's, you don't, you're not deluged. Uh, when there's an advertised position, when there's an ambassadorship or my chief of staff position, or my executive uh, director position in the Washington office, press director of press. Yeah, there's a lot of people that apply. But the lower level jobs, the lower level like this one was, there aren't a hell of a lot of applicants. Now, that doesn't mean you don't get referrals. I mean, you're always getting referrals. You're always getting some senator or congressman saying, you know, can you interview so-and-so? She's the world's greatest person. Uh, or other cabinet members or uh, friends or, you know, I, I mentioned my wife, she also sends people for me to interview. Uh, and I do it. I think that's a basic courtesy you extend to people. When John Podesta, who's a friend, uh, 
asked me to interview her. I didn't take it as a pressure call. He's a friend. We work together. He asked me to interview somebody that uh, he was interested in. He mentioned she was a friend of Betty Curry's. As a courtesy, I extended that, uh, that effort. That's all, that's all that happened. But there was no pressure, whatever, by anybody. I think everybody knows my record of hiring people. I, I, I have a good track record. My people are loyal. I hire them myself. Um, I interview them. Uh, I get a gut feeling about them. I'm not necessarily big on checking all the references. I have other people that do that. Other parts of the government do that. And, and this was the case with, uh, with Lewinsky. So after you extended the, or after you uh, told Lena Sutton to call up yeah. and extend the offer, did you before that ever call Ken Bacon? No, no. Did you ever ask Lena Sutton to call Ken Bacon? Did I ask who? A ask Lena Sutton to call no, Ken Bacon. No, no, no. Isabel Watkins no. to call. Is it your standard practice before extending an offer to not uh, call the person Employ current employer? Yeah, I, I've hired a lot of people without calling their employer. I hired Rebecca Cooper without calling her employer, Isabel Watkins. I know these, some of, some of the times I know these people uh, previously, or I get a gut instinct in the interview, and I like the person, I go for the person. So it is almost standard practice that I don't necessarily call all the ref. I have people do that. There's a State Department security system that involves the FBI that checks those records out. And if there's a problem, you always say, look, I'm extending you an offer based on your, your record, a security clearance. Now, Lewinsky already had a security clearance. She was at the Pentagon. She's at the White House. You assume that somebody's checked her out. And, and I was impressed with her resume. She works at the Department of Defense. On the issue of... Um Back on the issue of whether you would have had any telephone conversations with Ms. Lewinsky, first of all, I think you told us earlier on that it wouldn't be unusual or out of the question for you, perhaps, to call an applicant on the phone about their resume or about something related to their interview, correct? No. Um, when I will call a person, it'll be to say, I'd like to interview. Are, are you interested? That, that's the reason I would call somebody. But after the interview, to sort of close the deal, well, no, there, there have been times when I have done it myself. Um, I mean, I guess what I'm, I'm, and let me just ask it this way. When you say you don't believe you spoke to her on the phone, is that because you feel like you have a clear recollection and you are clear that you have never spoken to her on the phone, or is that just more, you don't typically do that, and you don't really remember one way or the other, but you don't think you would have talked to her on the phone because it's not your practice? It's not my practice. I, I, I am almost certain, I am certain that I didn't talk to her on the phone. I talked to her twice, once in, uh, in the interview, and another time, uh, November 15th, I remember, this was my birthday, I went to dinner with my wife at Club 21, and she was there with, uh, with her mother and some other guy, and she yelled at me, and I went from my table to her, and we just exchanged greetings. And so, that, so that was like a verbal communication. Well, um, let me focus on that for just a second, because in terms of running into Ms. Lewinsky at the 21 Club, um, now, on November 15th, it, based on what we've discussed before, do you agree that this is a time that is likely after the offer had been made to her? I don't know. Well, when we spoke a little earlier, you were I said thinking 10 days, a week or two. After days. October 31st, so that got us up to like, I think we were saying the 8th through like the yeah, 11th. Yeah, it could be. Do you think that you might have said something to the effect to her in the presence of the other people there? like, hey, and hey, the ball's in your court, or words to that effect? I don't think so, but I might have. I mean, I... If, in fact, the job had already been offered, do you think that would have been an unusual thing or unlikely? No, thing to no, I mean, what happened was I was walking away, and she yelled at me, and I went over, and I, I really, when I first saw her, I didn't know who she was. I remember that. And she said, uh, these are my parents, or this is my mother, and, and uh, 
I, I don't know, maybe I said, well, you've got a very impressive thought or something like that. But I, I don't think I said anything more than that. It was, it was in the restaurant. Okay. All right, let's shift gears a little bit. Um, Vernon Jordan. WBR 12. Mr. Lerner, you have some questions? This is an email from Monica to a friend of hers dated November 18th, which is a Tuesday. Um, and if you look at the first paragraph, um, starting at the, uh, the second sentence, I'm in the process of looking for a position in New York. I have been offered something at the UN, but I'm not really interested in staying in the government. Does this sort of increase your comfort level that she already had an offer uh, when you saw her on November 15th at the 21 Club? I have been offered some. Yeah, well, you, you'll have to ask Mona. I mean, isn't, right. is there a call from, when did Mona call her? Do we have Well, that? we've shown you. The call from Mona is November 19th. Well, but we have, I mean, the calls, I mean. There's a call. Well, and on the, if, if the issue is we don't know who's using your phone. Yeah. Extension. But we have a call on November 3rd. Then we have another call on November 19th. One, the number, November 3rd call is from your extension. The November 19th call is from Mona's extension. And those are the only records that at least we're aware of um, that indicate calls from your office to numbers that we associate with Ms. Lewinsky. I will state to you, and this is another thing that I would ask you, certainly we would want to know if there's more, I think that we recently did issue another subpoena to get to make sure we have any and all calls. And the one request I would make of you, if you could talk with your attorney, is because it is important to us to know that we have the entire universe of calls between your office and Ms. Lewinsky. We, we, wouldn't you have that already? I, I believe we do, but you're right. asking us about what calls there are, and I'm, I'm basically telling you the ones we're aware of. And the only issue there would be if there's some other calls that you have records of, certainly we would ask that you produce them. Well, no, I, I don't have any others. So anyway, those are the two dates in the month of November that we're aware of the calls coming from the your office. The 3rd and, and the 19th? Yeah, and then we had, yeah, because the one on the 14th and the 24th, I believe, were from her extension to you guys. Well, it could be that that the call, somebody called her uh, and, and she returned the call and got the offer in the return call. I don't know. Right? Well, I'm not gonna, we're not going to speculate, but yeah, I guess yeah. the point is, would you agree with this? However it was done, it was the offer was initiated by your office on a call. Yeah. And, and so we're telling you, based on the information we have, which records we have showing calls from your office. Yeah. All right? But it could be that the, the offer was made in a return call from Lewinsky to my office. Okay. The, that it, it might not have been done in the call that we initiated. Now, I, I can't say whether November 18th that she'd been offered this. I, I mean, I, I don't remember on the 15th saying to her, the offer, the ball's in your court. I think I, I said that I thought she was impressive. And, you know, I, I can't remember all this stuff. I mean, I'm dealing with a national crisis. <laughs> Believe me. Okay, any other questions on the, the email? All right. Um, let's shift gears to discuss Vernon Jordan. Um, yeah. how, do you, how well do you know Mr. Jordan? Well, I've known him uh, for about, I would say about um, eight, nine years. Okay. And uh, why don't you tell us how you met him, describe your relationship with him? I would say we're friends, uh, colleagues. Um, I would say that uh, I've looked to him for advice. Um, he uh, has helped me with career advice. Uh, he's, uh, I remember when I was staffing my ambassadors, I called him for suggestions. Uh, I've been a guest at his home uh, when the president was first elected in 1992. Um, 
we know each other, but I wouldn't call ourselves a very close relationship. But I've always called him for advice. I always find him to be very politically astute. And, you know, we discuss policy and politics, uh, but, but it's not a very frequent kind of relationship. Now, um, beginning with when you took over as ambassador up through, say, January of this year, how many times would you say you've spoken on the phone with Mr. Jordan? Since I took over as ambassador? Yes, sir. On the phone? Mm-hmm. Two, three times? And then how many times would you say you've met with him in person um, since taking over as ambassador? Um, well, we had breakfast once uh, at my residence. Uh, I, I, had, I was uh, in the month of December kind of looking for some career advice, and I wanted to get together with him here in Washington. And I recall we made a date, then we had to cancel. Then his office, I think, told us he was going to be in New York. So I invited him to breakfast. Um, when else during that year? I remember going to his office right before I was uh, confirmed. And then I saw him at a party about a month ago. That's it. And I, and I, and I, but I may have seen him at, at White House state dinners or receptions, but no, no conversation. Okay. When you need to get in touch with um, Mr. Jordan, are there any particular locales or numbers that you have your secretary call him at? Do you call him at home? Do you call no, him? No, call office? him at his office. In his office, being where do you know? A a here in Washington, Aiken Gump. So, do you feel confident that any calls that you would have originated? to speak with Vernon Jordan would have been directed to his Aiken Gump law yeah. firm office. Yeah, I don't even think I have his phone number. <coughs> and to the degree that Mr. Jordan has contacted you since you've been ambassador, um, would there be any particular location or numbers that, to your knowledge, he's contacted you at? I don't think he's ever called me at the UN. He, his office will call Isabel, the UN office. If, if, but, but I, you know, I even think on the telephone, we may have spoken twice, maybe before I was confirmed, but may, and maybe once during my UN tenure. You're but then we did have that meeting. But the once during my UN tenure was early on, when I was, I remember talking to him about personnel matters. Okay. Well, I want to, let me show you a series of calls that I want to ask you about, Tim, and if we could have... Next exhibit in order, man. It's going to be WBR 13. Okay. I'm going to make a few representations to you and then ask you some questions. Right. Okay. First of all, I'm going to direct your attention to <coughs> exhibit WBR 13, which, as you can see, contains 10 separate phone calls, correct? Right. And if you look at these, I'll represent to you, these are based upon phone records right. obtained by the Office of Independent Counsel, right. and that all of these calls relate to phone calls placed on December 11th from Vernon Jordan's office, okay? Right. Now, if you look at call number five, you'll see that's a call at 1117 from Vernon Jordan's office at to... Ambassador Richardson, at least that's the phone listing. And that it was a three minute and 12 second call. Do you see that, sir? Right. right. And I'm gonna make a few other representations to you and then I'm gonna ask you some questions. I'll also represent to you that we've had testimonial evidence as well as documents indicating that Mr. Jordan met with Monica Lewinsky on December 11th um, and discussed with her possible jobs in New York. And let me ask you a question first, sir. Have you come to any understanding, whether it be through press accounts or any other sources, that Mr. Jordan allegedly placed any, made any efforts to help Ms. Lewinsky get a job in any individual companies in New York? Yeah, through press accounts. And what companies, to your knowledge, was that? I don't know. Um, um, public relations. Do, do, based on the press accounts you've seen, are you aware of allegations that Mr. Jordan placed um, calls to 
Young and Rubicam, American Express, and uh, Revlon. Well, I know through press accounts, but I, I don't know the companies. I, I don't remember. All right. Well, I'll represent to you, sir, that we've had at least testimony, just by way of background, that there were calls placed by Mr. Jordan to Young and Rubicon, American Express, and Revlon. Yeah. Um, and now directing your attention to uh, this series of calls, you'll note that the calls here, the earliest one is at 9.45 a.m., and the latest one is at 1.07 p.m. Do you see that, sir? Yeah. Is this, is this all the same day? Yes, sir, it is. It's all on December 11th. And I'll indicate to you we've also had testimony and documentary evidence of a meeting by Mr. Jordan with Ms. Lewinsky on that day. Okay. And you'll note that, that the phone records at least indicate that the calls from Mr. Jordan's office um, went to, among others, persons at Young and Rubicam, American Express, right. and Revlon. Do you see that listed? Yeah. Okay. And I guess my question to you is, what did you and Mr. Jordan talk about on that day? Well, I don't think I talked to him. This, I think he called Isabel. Okay. Or his office called Isabel. And I think it's relating to the, I wanted to see him, and we were trying to schedule it. Okay. And what was it that you and needed to speak to Mr. Jordan about? You know, it was just career advice. Um, I hadn't seen him in a while. Um, just staying in touch. Okay, now if this was something that was initiated by you then wanting to see him, would you expect then, sir, that we would see at least sometime in this rough time period before this call, a call from your office to Mr. Jordan's office? Well, it could be. We also invited him to some events, some dinners, and it could be that his office was calling and saying he couldn't come. We had some social events, some okay. dinners. And when you say invited him, how would those invitations be conducted? Through my protocol office. Meaning telephone calls or? Telephone calls and in writing. Um, yeah, the protocol office, that would be actually, if we were looking at phone records, that would be a record that actually comes back to UN protocol office or something yeah, like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, what, but this is December 11th? Yes, sir. Yeah, I mean, this could be relating to, uh, oh, I, I think I know what it is. What's that? Um, I had one of those dates, I had a, a um, around those dates, I had an event for the president at my residence. And what would the event have been? Yeah, this, yeah, this was uh, uh, 10 p.m. I invited some of, some people as friends over after a pretty rough day. And I think Jordan is responding to the invitation. And when you, go on. I think it, you might be recalling December 9th, I think you and the president attended the 50th anniversary of the Museum of Jewish Heritage. Newspaper accounts reflect that. Yeah. And then December 10th, I don't know if you were at, whether you attended an event with the president at the um, Rainbow Room for the Democratic History. No, no, no you didn't I, didn't, attend that. I didn't. But are those the events that you had in mind when you? Yeah, and it could be that he's calling back and saying why he couldn't come or. But, but this would be that event was December 9th, and these phone calls are December 11th. Yeah. No, I didn't. I don't. I, did, I am s almost certain I didn't talk to him December 11th. Yeah. I, I'm al almost absolutely sure. I don't even think I've ever talked to Vernon on the phone from my office. So when you say you're almost certain that you wouldn't have spoken to him on December 11th, is that because you feel confident you didn't speak to him at all in the month of De December, for example, on the phone? Or is that because you have some specific reason why on the particular day of December 11th you couldn't have spoken to him? Well, I had breakfast with him. That, and I, and I'll just when was, when was the breakfast? The date of that, at least according to the records we have, was I believe January 6th. So that would have been a few weeks It later. could be that we were, we were trying to schedule uh, a meeting and he was responding to Isabel for the meeting. I wanted to have the meeting in Washington. And then I went away for Christmas and came back, I think, on the 4th. And so they kept trying to set the meeting up. But I think it's relating to the meeting. Now, was there ever a time um, in any conversations that you had with Mr. Jordan, if you had any, and certainly you did on the morning of the breakfast, where he indicated in any way that he was um, attempting to help someone get a job in New York? No, no none whatsoever. Did he ever indicate to you in any way anything in relation to whether he used the name or not at the time? 
um, someone that you believe might have been a reference to Monica Lewinsky? No, not at all. He never mentioned her name whatsoever. Did you ever mention to Mr. Jordan or suggest to him that there was anyone um, referred to you by Mr. Podesta or anyone, but that you would have been referencing Monica Lewinsky, that you would, were engaged in any kind of discussions about a job with? None whatsoever. Monica Lewinsky's name never came up in my conversation with Vernon Jordan, whatsoever. And when you say her name didn't come up, are you also saying that there was no reference to someone who turned out to be her, whether her name was no, used or not? that's right. We didn't discuss any personnel matters when we had our breakfast. Have you ever discussed uh, personnel matters in terms of you know, any particular person, whether to hire them or not, with Vernon Jordan, to your knowledge? Well, yeah. Um, th there was uh, one of my deputies. I wanted an African-American uh, deputy, and I called them for suggestions. This was early in my uh, administration. Okay. So I didn't been... hire the person he said. <laughs> Did you interview him? Yeah, yeah. That would have been in uh, early 1997? Yeah, that would have been in January or right. February. Now, I'll also direct your attention to what we're going to call um, WBR 14. which is another list of phone records, and I'll rec represent to you, sir, if you look at the top of that page, you'll see it says Aiken Gump, Yeah. that these are phone records reflecting calls from one of the three phones associated with Mr. Jordan's office to other places, and if you look at the highlighted call at the bottom, that call, it's the second to last one on the page, December 15th, 9.53 a.m., yeah. To which I'll represent to you is the Watergate Hotel. Right. Now, first of all, just looking at the schedule, December 15th would have been a Monday. Um, do you have any way of knowing whether you would have been at the Watergate Hotel on December 15th? No, but I'm sure we could find out. Okay. Do you have any rec uh, remembrance of getting a call or even a message um, at right. the Watergate Hotel that Vernon Jordan had called for you? No, but it could be that we were trying to set up the meeting during that period. That was the last week before I went off for Christmas. And it could be that his office was trying to track us down. I think we had a meeting set, and I had to cancel, as I recall, or he had to cancel. So it could be that this was a back and forth on, uh, on that scheduled meeting. And it could be that they called the Watergate. Is this a call that came to me? Um, it's a call that went to the Watergate Hotel, and so I'm asking yeah. you if you think it could have gone to you or... No, it, well, no, it couldn't. At 9.53, I'd be doing something. I wouldn't be sitting around the hotel. Okay. This in the morning. Yes. So it could be his staff trying to reach me to set up the meeting or trying to find or connect with Isabel or... So the bottom line is you have no idea whether that was to, even to you or your office, but it could have been. You just don't know. Well, is this to my room? No, sir, that's why I'm asking. Oh, yeah, no, I, you're probably recall. not to me. Right, that's what I'm asking. I mean, yeah. you just have no way of knowing. You certainly, as you sit here now, you have no basis to conclude that you no. have spoken with him on December 15th. No. I really almost think I have not spoken to him on the phone, period. All right. Now, let me ask a shift to another subject. Um, I'm assuming you are at least generally familiar, based on press accounts, if nothing else, with the fact of the Paula Jones lawsuit. Yeah. And that you would have been aware of the existence of the Paula Jones lawsuit um, in late 1997, correct? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> now, had you ever had any conversations of a substantive nature um, with anyone at the White House about the Paula Jones lawsuit, namely about issues, strategies, what should or shouldn't be done? No. Remember, I'm in New York. I'm, I'm not. As a foreign policy cabinet member, I don't participate in, in any domestic politics or discussions or fundraisers. So, the Have you ever, and just, I assume this is included in that, but I just want to make clear. Have you ever had any conversations with 
President Clinton about anything related to the Paula Jones lawsuit? No, nothing whatsoever. Have you ever had any conversations with any of President Clinton's attorneys or persons that you believed were acting on his behalf in that lawsuit about the Paula Jones lawsuit? No. Have you ha ever had any discussions with Vernon Jordan about the Paula Jones lawsuit? No. Now, let me show you another series of phone calls, and this is going to be on December 22nd. Okay. This will be the next exhibit. Ma'am? No. Thank you. So it's exhibit WBR 15. And, sir, I'll represent to you that these are another compilation or just a little quick summary of phone calls indicated in phone records for the date of December 22nd. And you'll notice there are three calls on here, correct? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you'll see, sir, that there's the first call on here is at 4.59 p.m. Right. from Vernon Jordan's office to the White House operator. Do you see that? Yeah. And it was two, uh, two minutes and 12 seconds. Right. You'll see that the next call was from Vernon Jordan's office right. um, four minutes later to Monica Lewinsky's Pentagon office number, and it was uh, just 18 seconds, right. very short. And then you'll notice that immediately thereafter at 5.04, there is a call from Vernon Jordan's office to at least um, your office, although not your individual extension. Ambassador Richardson's office, UN office, which I believe if we recall from the other records, would be Ms. Watkins' right. office. Do you see that, sir? Yes. And that would have been a minute and 24 seconds. Is that right? Right. Do you know whether or not you would have gotten a message or any um, phone call from Mr. Jordan that you were aware of around December 22nd? No. I think what it is, it's uh, setting up this breakfast that went through several processes and changes, or set up this meeting. As I recall, on December I may have even been out of the country because I, I either left the 22nd, 23rd, 24th. I went to Mexico for a vacation. So I don't even know if I was in town the 22nd. I might have been. But no, I did not speak to Jordan. This must have been to Isabel relating to the breakfast or the meeting that we were going to have in, in early January. And, sir, I'll make a, a further representation to you that based on testimony in the grand jury as well as records were obtained, that December 22nd was the day that Mr. Jordan brought Monica Lewinsky to an attorney by the name of Frank Carter after being advised by Ms. Lewinsky that she had been subpoenaed in the Paula Jones case to testify. Right. Um, do you have any basis to believe that Mr. Jordan would have tried to contact you on the day that he addressed Ms. Lewinsky's subpoena in the Paula Jones case about anything related to Monica Lewinsky? No. I, I never talked to him that day. I think and he called, they called uh, Isabel about the schedule. And are you absolutely 100% sh um, sure in your testimony that at no time did Vernon Jordan ever, whether it was a call, a written communication, or anything in person, communicate anything to you that related to Monica Lewinsky or the Paula Jones case? I am 100% absolutely sure. When did you first learn, and how did you first learn, that Ms. Lewinsky was somehow implicated or wit you know, noted as a possible witness in the Paula Jones case? Well, like everybody else in the world, uh, I was uh, at the Watergate Hotel, ironically, and uh, the press reports came out, uh, the, I don't know, the morning, of, it was in January, and uh, that's when I first heard about it. That's when I first heard Monica Lewinsky's name in connection with uh, this problem. That was the first time. Now, um so you had no, had heard nothing about, uh, you made no connection or were, no one ever said anything that give you reason to make a connection between Monica Lewinsky, the person you had offered employment, and the president 
or the Paula Jones case until you heard about it in the press. Which, That's correct. And I'll tell you, for purposes of reference, I believe it started hitting the press around, as far as the mainstream press, around January 20th, 21st in that time frame. That's right. And I believe we had ended, my office had ended our contact with Monica Lewinsky when I, I told Mona to find out to have her fish or cut bait, and she told me, uh, I don't know if it was in December or January, okay, well, that, Mon that Monica was, was pursuing other options. All right, we'll go ahead and look at the next exhibit, which is 16 then, WBR 16. <coughs> and so if you take a look at this, this is a copy of an email that I believe we got from your office. Um, it says on it, Lynn Martindale. Who, who's Lynn Martindale? She is head of, uh, well, she is the personnel person. And where is she located? In New York. So she works for you in New York? Yeah. And then it's um, from Wayne Logsdon. Who's Wayne Logsdon? He is the head of the administrative department. In other words, Lynn's boss at USUN. Okay, and then it says CC Peter Burley. Who's that? He is my number two in Betsy. He's sort of the manager of the mission. And then you'll see here it says, Subject, Monica Lewinsky, date Tuesday, December 23rd. And it says, Lynn, if this name pops up on your screen, it's, it's the one the ambassador has in mind of bringing on board as a secretary, I believe. More to come as I know it. Do you right. see that? Okay. Right. So do you agree then, based on this email, that at least as of December 23rd, uh, the offer to Ms. Lewinsky was still pending? Yeah. Now, well, let, let's see. I told Mona to fish or cut bait on Lewinsky. I think it was in December. I said, you know, just find out where this thing is. Okay. Is she with us or not? I think it was before the holidays. <coughs> now, um, can you think of any reason why the name would, quote, pop up in terms of someone's screen or, or issues? And specifically, Lynn uh, Martindale around that time. Well, frame? yeah, because uh, I think as I told you, um, Cooper made me aware of the problem with shifting the job from Washington to New York. Wayne Lodgston would do this through Martindale. So you believe then that this is it accurate then that your assumption is is that this email might have had some relation to the fact that around this time frame, the whole issue of shifting a job to New York was being, you know, was coming up from a, as a procedural matter? Well, it could have been a, a little earlier. You'd have to ask Cooper. She was engaged in these talks with Wayne and Martindale. All right. See, technically, Gina, Gina Griego's position was Schedule C, I think, secretarial here at the U.S., uh, at the U.S. U.N. office in Washington. So what they are thinking is that we were shifting Lewinsky into that slot. I think that's, but they, they were aware, I think, of, of my uh, wanting to shift the position through, through uh, what uh, Cooper had been telling them. Is it possible that this email was prompted by some comment from you to Mr. Logsdon on the 22nd or the 23rd of December? This is that, actually, that right there. Yeah, it could be. I mean, I talked to him a lot about personnel. I mean, it could be that I said, yeah, wait, you know, what, what's going on here? I want to shift this from here to there. Mm -hmm. It could be that I mentioned it to Wayne, too. All right, now we'll go to the next um, exhibits we have, which is going to be two exhibits. And while we're getting those ready, let me ask you, did you at any time during this process, either directly or through one of your uh, subordinates or associates, communicate with either Mr. Podesta's office or Ms. Curry um, about the status of anything related to Ms. Lewinsky? Not with John Podesta whatsoever. Uh, at one point, I bumped into Betty Curry, I believe, in the basement of the White House. And I said something to the effect you know, I interviewed your friend, I liked her, and Betty hugged me, and that was the end of it. It was like a chance encounter. Did she hug you 
like almost as a result of the interview or did she hug you first because it's your normal way of greeting and then you told her this? Um, I think she hugged me afterwards. She's very, she's very effusive. She's very hugging. She's, that, that's how she is. Can you, do you believe that this um, chance encounter where you relay this information to her would have been, um, obviously after you interviewed her, but Mona, Monica, but would it have been before the job offer? Or do you think it was after the job offer? I don't remember. Okay. Could have been before or after. Might, um, might have been after. Did Ms. Curry say anything to you in response to the information? No, she, she just hugged me. She didn't say anything. Could have been before. I don't remember. I remember seeing Betty uh, in the basement of the White House where I always have my meeting. That's where you bump into everybody. Could have been at a, a Christmas event. I don't I can't remember. Um, but I, I think it was, uh, I think it was, I, I don't remember whether it was before or after the, the, uh, the offer or the interview. I don't remember. Did it, it was after the interview. Right. But you don't know whether it was before or after the offer. Yeah. But clearly it was, it was not, it was definitely before Ms. Lewinsky ultimately conveyed that she did not want to take the offer. Yeah. Yeah. And did Ms. Curry even make any statements of recognition? indicating that she knew that you were doing this for her, for Monica Lewinsky? No, not at all. Okay, any other communication to anyone um, about any status of Ms. Lewinsky? No. Other than people in your office? No, I, this was my decision uh, to hire her. I did not do it under any pressure or anything. I felt that she would be suitable for the job, and, and I... Uh, didn't feel I had to report to anybody. I, it's not in my nature. Okay, well, I don't take pressure well on personnel matters. And John Podesta's a friend, and Betty Curry's a friend, and I was... Well, let me ask you this. It was John Podesta, you have told us, who asked you to interview her, correct? Yes. And when you set out to have your secretary try to get a hold of the resume, you were doing that be as a favor to John Podesta, correct? I was interviewing her. I, I was trying to be responsive to John. Yeah, he's a friend. And it was at least your belief at that time that the whole impetus for setting in motion the interview, which later turned into a job offer for Ms. Lewinsky, was stemming from a request by John Podesta, yes, correct? Yes, yes. Yeah. And I'm not asking you right now whether you were pressured, and what I'm asking is a little different. Um, wouldn't you, under those circumstances, feel it natural or normal to notify John Podesta of the status of the person who you got a resume from, interviewed and offered a job to as a result of John Podesta's request? No, I mean, John Podesta's a, a friend. He's deputy chief of staff. I'm a cabinet member. I don't have to account for anything. Uh, he asked me to interview somebody. That's all he asked me to do is interview her, and I interviewed her. And I didn't feel I had to say, John, I interviewed her, or John, this is the status. Why, why should I? This was my, uh, my choice. Uh, my decision, and I stand behind that. Okay, now we'll go to the next uh, two exhibits. <coughs> okay. Now, if you look at these, and ma'am, what's the numbers? 17. Okay, so we've got WBR 17. Let's see. Okay. WBR 18. If you look at the uh, bottom here, and this, uh, at the bottom of this page, there's a call according to the record that was placed on January 5th, 1998. Right. You see that, sir? Right. At 11.32, it was a one-minute call, and I'll represent to you, sir, that this phone number where it says D. Finnerman right. is the phone number of Ms. Lewinsky's aunt, who lives in Watergate, okay. and who we've had testimony that Ms. Lewinsky would frequently stay at her house. Okay. And then you'll note that the call was placed to Ms. Sutphin's phone number. Do you see okay. that? Yeah. Okay, now let's go to the next page, which WBR 18, I believe, is, it, it appears to be a memo from Ms. Sutphin to you, correct, sir? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And if you look it over, you'll see that it covers two topics, the second of which is Monica Lewinsky. Yeah. Okay. Now, and I'm just going to read aloud, as to Monica Lewinsky, it says, she has declined the position in the hopes of going private sector, for example, Burst and Marcella or the like. She thanks you again for giving her the option to come to USUN. She'd like to call sometime this week to thank you in person. 
Do you want her to call, or should I tell her to send you a note? Do you see that, sir? Yeah. All right. And I'd also just direct your attention so we can see if we can get a frame of reference time-wise, that if you look at the first paragraph, which deals with an unrelated person named Ali Olivas, yeah. you'll see that about midway through, it's referring to someone talking to Ben or Monday, I mean to Ben on Monday or Tuesday, yeah. which was the 29th or 30th, and then talking about an email that had been sent on Friday, January 2nd. Do you see that? Yeah. Um, now, based on these two documents... Can we introduce them? Mm -hmm. This document also. Okay. Yeah. All right, so we'll go to... Oh, I'm sorry. Getting ahead of myself here. And just so you'll know, what we're trying to do here is bracket the time yeah. when perhaps the final declination was communicated, and that's why I'm showing you these documents. And what number is this? 19. 19. So, Sorry. yeah. And so directing your attention to WBR 19. The reason I do this is because, is this 17? Yes. So 17 reflects a 1132 phone call um, from... Um, from Ms. Lewinsky's aunt, where we know she stayed, to Mona Sutphin. Mona Sutphin. And then if you look at the highlighted portion of Exhibit 19, sir, the one that's on the top, yeah. you'll see that the highlighted portion shows a call four minutes later at 11.36, a two-minute call from 415-4398, in which... No, it's from the Aiken Gump. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm looking at a different... Um, the number dialed is the U.S. mission to the U.N. Protocol. Oh, I see. I got it. I got a different one. Okay. All right. Well, let me back up on this then. First of all, let's just address, let's come back to that document then. We'll start okay. with 18? the first two. Okay. Looking at these two documents, does this help you or give you any um, basis to tell us when you believe it was that Ms. Sutphin would have spoken with Ms. Lewinsky? Um, and gotten, you know, said Fisher cut bait or words to that effect and gotten a firm declination? I think it was very early January. Okay. And based on the phone call on the 5th, do you think at least it could have been approximately, we know it was after the 2nd, right, sir, based on the, yeah. the email, I mean, the... Yeah, I think email. it must have been on the, what is the 5th, what day? Monday. 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 Yeah, let's pull it up. must have been end. Monday, yeah, because everybody I remember got back the 3rd or 4th. There you go. And there's January 1998, and yeah. the 5th is a Monday. Right. I think, see, what, what had happened, this Ollie Olivas uh, guy was one, was one of the first people that supported me to go to Congress. And he died over Christmas, and I didn't even know about it. And so I think there, were, there was a major effort to let me know as soon as I got back that he had died. And I remember being very upset that nobody had told me that he had died. And so immediately when we got back from Mexico, we responded to his wife so that so it was I'm, I'm sure there's a very early January time frame that Mona got the final word from Olinsky I guess and then if we look at the last call um, the one that's highlighted on number 19 WBR 19 the document all the way to your right yeah this once again is an Aiken Gump document and if you look at the highlighted call I'll represent to you that that number is one of Mr. Jordan's secretary's extensions, right. and then it's two, which according to our records is the U.S. mission to the U.N. Do you see that, right. sir? Right, right. That's probably to set up the breakfast, right? Okay, and that's what I was going to ask you, any understanding of what that call might be about? Well, yeah, it was probably relating to the breakfast that, when did I have breakfast with Jordan? The next day, the 6th. Okay. Well, that's what it probably was about, yeah. And is, it, and is it accurate that, as far as this breakfast that you had with Mr. Jordan, this was something that, that at least got set in motion on your request? At my request, at my initiative. Okay. In, in the month of December, or May, as, as I recounted earlier. And, and once again, I just want to make sure we're clear on the record. Um, is it your testimony that any communication on this date, January 5th, between Mr. Jordan's office and yours, at least to your knowledge, would have nothing to do with Monica Lewinsky or any of the matters attendant to her? Absolutely. Okay. So now, 
Yeah, I actually want to ask you, and, and let me give you the next exhibit. I'm sorry, man. Here you go. Which I guess is WBR 20. And ask you about this, and, and ask you if you even know what these references refer to, because um, this is, I'll represent to you, this is something that we got from your office based on our request for documents relating to Monica Lewinsky, and right. et cetera. Right. And we're not exactly sure what this document is, and we were hoping you could shed some light on it. Right. And I think just for purposes, you may be more astute than me, but just something that took me a little while to figure out is I think usually if you start at the bottom with these things and go up, yeah. that's chronological instead okay. of in reverse. Okay, well, this is what I was telling you earlier, that there was confusion over the slot. At one point, my personnel people wanting to give away a political slot and make it in the Foreign Service, which I would not take kindly to, <laughs> because it eliminates my ability to choose somebody. So I, I had, uh, I think, uh, spoken to Wayne Lawson and said, Wayne, you know, I want this Foreign Service position uh, I, I don't want it a foreign service. I want to leave it the way it is. It's a political slot. I want to move it from Washington to New York, to New York make it happen. Don't, where are you getting that I want to make it a foreign service slot? It's not a secretarial slot. So keep it a Schedule C. Okay. I think that's what it is. Now, if you look at the, what I'm going to say is roughly, I guess, the second entry up where it says WKL. Yeah which I guess is a message from uh, Peter Burley at 8.27 in the morning on Monday. It says, I spoke with this issue about Rebecca, uh, I'm sorry, let me start over. I spoke about this issue with Rebecca Cooper on Friday. She's going to re reclama with Richardson today, Monday, since she says she had approved the switch and still wants it done. Stay tuned. And then it says, and don't cancel the personnel action yet. Do you see that? What do you understand that reference to don't cancel the personnel action yet? What Cooper wanted, as I recall, is she wanted it both ways. She didn't want to lose a secretarial position. And she also wanted the flexibility to shift the position to the Schedule C to New York. So what she was trying to do is get the best of both worlds, get a secretarial position done by the Foreign Service that, that we would pay for our budget and then move the position on to uh, New York with the Schedule C. And I think there was just confusion about exactly what I wanted done. What I thought was happening, what Cooper thought was happening, was that we were losing this Schedule C slot and make it into Foreign Service. And I didn't, I didn't want that to happen, so I was just... Okay. I mean, all of this, I, I, you know, I, I don't know all this stuff. That's fine, and it, and it may be because I don't either. That's why I'm asking, and you may not know, and yeah. we're just trying to figure it out. And then if we go up to the next entry up, where it says, Peter, thanks for the heads up. I had initiated the cancellation already since he wanted it done. Now, that line there about the cancellation, I'm assuming that's a reference to where it says in the prior email, don't cancel the personnel action yet. What I'm trying to figure out here is if that has to do with whether a cancellation was or wasn't done, and if so, whether that was because um, it, you guys learned that Monica Lewinsky was not taking the job, so then somebody said, oh, we'll no, cancel no. a personnel. No, no, no. It had, no, no. It had simply to do with, I w didn't want to lose the slot. When is this, in January? Yes, sir. These are dated January. No, no. I, and I filled, I, I, filled, uh, I filled the slot. Yeah, but I'm sorry. Just so you'll see, the first one starts December 23rd. Yeah. Which actually, if you think about it, ties in with the one we saw a little while ago. Okay. If, if this name pops up on your screen, that was yeah. December 23rd. Okay. And then they continue on to January 5th. Yeah. Okay. Any more on that? All right, now let's go to, I think next we go to your breakfast. We have a, um, your itinerary for that day. And this will be WBR. Thank you. Do you recognize this as being a, a copy of a schedule you would get? Yeah. 
Does this appear to be an accurate reflection of your schedule for Tuesday, January 6th, 1998? Yes. And you'll note at 8 o'clock you had the breakfast with Vernon Jordan at the Waldorf Astoria. Do you right. see that? Right. Now that would mean at your place, basically. Your uh, room? At my residence. Do you eat in the residence or do you go down and eat out? Um, no, at, at the residence. Okay. Um, okay, tell us, what was the sub general subject matter of your meeting with Mr. Jordan? It was, as I said, it was at my initiative. Um, the purpose was to seek some career advice from Jordan. Uh, I entered uh, my first year at the UN. Um, <coughs> I, about, I, I wanted to get his advice on the problem we were having with Congress on UN arrears. Um, I consider him somebody that in the past he's helped me. Um, I like the guy, uh, but it was mainly to talk about you know career moves. I remember I was starting to uh, hit 50, and I wanted to ask him some advice about what he thought I might do in the future, and and that was the purpose of the meeting. And once again. Was there any aspect of this meeting at any point that had anything to do with Monica Lewinsky getting a job for someone other than your own potential career move or anything even remotely attendant to Monica Lewinsky, Paula Jones' case, or the president? No, not at all. But let me just say, I was just in a figurative sense asking about career advice. I wasn't thinking of changing. I'm, I'm very happy where I am. <laughs> for the record. For the record. <laughs> Okay, and then finally, and I think this is the last record we have to show you, in terms of um, phone records, etc. Okay, WBR 22. Okay. Which will indicate to you our phone records reflecting pagers. Pages? Right. And if you look at the highlighted portion, I'll represent to you that this is a, a pager record of Monica Lewinsky's pager that she had at the time, right. and that this particular document, if you follow it across, it shows an 8.54 a.m., but I'll also represent to you that that's from Pacific time. So it's 11.54 Eastern time in the morning call on January 7th, or I should say page, right. where it says, please call Mona Sutphin at... Can you, do you have any understanding of why Ms. Sutphin would have been paging Monica Lewinsky on January 7th? Well, it could be, I mean, I'm, I'm just looking at those documents that she was, Monica, Monica told Mona that she wasn't taking the job, but she wanted to come and thank me or send me a letter. And maybe Mona was calling and saying, send a letter. Okay. Because you recall that that was one of the, the kind of follow-up issues that you had had based on the um, memo from yeah, Mona, Yeah, I, I mean, she, in fact, I, I, I was going to say to Mona, don't, don't bother. I mean, this thing is over. Uh, she doesn't have to send me a letter. I didn't want to have another meeting. Well, you sort of, um, how did you feel about the fact that, in essence, you guys waited uh, almost two months, I guess, six weeks or so, and before she got back to you? Did it leave a, a neutral feeling in your mouth that you have sort of a bad... Uh, no, reaction to it, or no, it, it was a non-feeling. We just move on. The fact is, we did not keep the job open for her for two months. What we did was, <coughs> first, she asked for an extension of time. We, we gave it to her. Then we had the Iraq problem. And then in late December, this is my calculation, I said to Mona, tell her to fish or cut bait. And, and that was it. Now, I, I didn't have a bad feeling. I, I, I sensed from the update from Mona at some point that she was looking for uh, something in the private sector, that this is probably what she wanted to do. I mean, she said it in the interview. Mona hinted at it when she, I think, at one point said to me, I think she wants to go in the private sector. I don't think she wants to work here. That's my gut feeling. Okay. Now, you told us that, um, I think when you were recounting the times that you think you might have communicated with Vernon Jordan, since you became ambassador, um, you said you didn't believe there were very many. You know that you had this breakfast in um, January and that you saw him one time since. Is that accurate? Yeah. And that was about a month ago? 
Yeah, maybe six weeks ago. Okay, and what was the circumstance of that? This was a party here in New York uh, at the home of uh, a woman by the name of Molly Razor. And it was a dinner party. I was, I was again, sitting at my table, and he came over and said hello. Did you and Mr. Jordan at that time have any discussions at all about the Monica Lewinsky situation, um, the fact of, as it turns out, your involvement in potential job for her and or his, or anything even remotely no. related to him? No, it was just a greedy. So no discussion at all about Monica Lewinsky? No. no. Have you had any communication at any time up to the present with Mr. Jordan, either directly or indirectly, about anything related to Monica Lewinsky, the job hunt, Paula Jones case or any of that? No. Have you had any communication up to the president, up to the present, um, directly or indirectly with the president? No. None about whatsoever. Any of those topics? The president and I have never discussed Monica Lewinsky or Paula Jones. Never. Or the, the fact that you were involved in uh, offering her a job and interviewing her? No. We have not discussed it whatsoever. When is the first time that you would have been made aware in any way that there might be a possible link on the job front between Vernon Jones and Monica, um, Vernon Jordan and Monica Lewinsky. Well, it, 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 when when the whole issue exploded in January, so based on press, press, time, press accounts, right? Press accounts. Nothing prior to that. No, actually, it was this guy Matt Grudge who surfaced my name or my meeting mystery meeting at the Watergate. Okay. That's how I. And I guess that was the same day that the story broke. It was at, I guess there was one Drudge report that was out around January 18th or 19th? 18th, 19th, 20th. The same day it broke. Okay. Because I was asked to comment on the Drudge report. Okay. Other than um, your attorney or attorneys, um, have you spoken to anyone um, about you know, in preparation for your appearance here today, namely to talk to us or anyone from the OIC when you interviewed with them, et cetera? No. I mean, since then? Since oh, I at any time? No. Either, even before the interview? No. I've not talked to anybody. Okay. And no, other, except my attorneys. My, my attorneys. And obviously, I don't, I don't want to get into the details of that. Other than with your attorneys, do you have any um, understanding that you, either directly or indirectly, either through your attorneys or others, will communicate with anyone else, like Vernon Jordan, anyone on behalf of the president, about your testimony? No. No, there. I, I don't want to, you know, and I, I've instructed my attorney to, you know, he's representing me. And he, he's also very good about this. And just to, um, in other words, like coordinate with others? Correct. No, no, we don't do that. And have you had any discussions with anyone at White House Counsel's office, like Bruce Lindsay or No, they Charles don't know I'm here. About any, anything related no. to this? No, no, no. Has anyone, other than your attorneys, uh, and other than the agents from my office and then today with us, has anyone attempted to debrief you or ask you questions other than the press no. about what happened with no. the UN job, et cetera, and Monica Lewinsky? No. Other than the press? Yes, sir. No. No. No way. And let me ask you a last little batch of documents. We received, um, and by the way, just to show you, here's a copy, which I guess we'll mark as, what is it, exhibit <coughs> three for you. Yeah, do you want to get the original? Of the, the schedule that I know we do have, and when I indicated to you we were hoping we could get these for October, November, December, so yeah. you know what we're referencing. You think you already produced it? Yeah. I'll uh, take a look. We'll it's double check. And I didn't see did, it. I think there was a whole batch of stuff coming in today. Or, or, but, but I said, do a day-to-day -day from the day they want. Like, where was I that day? Okay. Anyway, it's exhibit WBR23, which is right. a copy of your schedule for January of 1998, correct? Right. And so we just want to make sure that we get similar schedules for, um, I guess we'll say September through December of Yeah, sure. Okay. Now, let me just check for a second. Another exhibit. Let's go ahead and get a copy of 
Okay. If you look at this circuit, this is another exhibit that we don't quite know what we're looking at and see if you're able to tell us anything. It's WBR24. And this is um, a copy of a document that you'll see it's the stationery anyway, so it's a fax cover sheet. Yeah. The White House Office of Legislative Affairs right. to you. Although at the top it shows October 8, 1997, um, from Ambassador Richardson, and then it gives. Right. You know, it's just going down the page. It, it shows that it's one of ten pages. Right. And then if you look at the handwritten stuff on the left, can you tell us what that says? What? Yes, sir. What, what you're pointing to. Okay. It says Rebecca Cooper talked to me about this. I spoke to Becerra again at request of White House, October 9th, before vote. Okay. Is that your handwriting? Yeah. Do you, do you even know what this is uh, in relation yeah, to? Yeah, I'm pretty sure. What is this? Um, this was relating to uh, I think the White House asked me to call Becerra about an education issue, and I did. Um, this was, uh, is that October 8th? That's what it says on it, yes, sir. In fact, yeah. the, this, the this is Congressman Becerra of, of California. Okay. And it was relating to a vote on education. And, so, and, 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 and what was attached was the talking points. Right. This was included in a production. Yeah, and I don't know if it was a mistake. Yeah, no, well, I mean, we're trying to figure out what this has to do with, yeah. is there, to your knowledge, does this have anything to do with Monica Lewinsky, no. <laughs> no. job hunting, what have you? No. Okay, so we'll assume, what I would do is just do this. Well, actually, I tell you what, we will confer with your attorney during the break to see if they had some other basis for uh, giving you it to You know why? Us. You know why? And I'm going to do your job for you. Yeah, I would appreciate it. You, you had asked for any contact with Susan Brophy. Okay. So Thanks. maybe because she got a copy of this. Okay, that's fine. And Susan Brophy is where? Susan Brophy used to be in uh, the White House Legislative Affairs. Okay, perfect. Thank you. All right, and then we just have some other documents given to us by you. Now, there was a uh, press statement. This just doesn't really matter, whatever number they're coming up in. Let me just look at this for a second and see how much we even want to go through. With, uh, this will be WBR 25, correct? Yes, sir, I ask if you look at this and tell us if you recognize it. And, and just so you know, so you're not confused, and maybe the best thing is to give him the series, because there are several different, what looks like they might be versions of a press statement, and I don't know. Yeah, yeah. I don't want you to be confused as to which one is which. So why don't we give him the other copies, which will be... Looks like we have, what? One, two... Okay, I have one, two, three, four, five sheets of paper. And I'm not sure, it looks like at least two of them are identical. Which one do you already have? Just, just yeah. Thank you. What I want to do is give you all of them so you can look at them and tell us which one, to your knowledge, if any, was the final version and what's Well, what. I can tell you that now. This one is the same except for the factual. Because I, I'm the one that drafted the final one. Okay, that's what I wanted to ask. Okay, well, let's, okay so we don't have to give him the extra one on that. Yeah, this, this was the final one. Okay. And then let's go ahead and give him the other. Yeah, do we have? Yes, we have three others, so let's give you those. Yeah, that'd be fine. And have the court reporter identify them. So, and ma'am, will that be 26, 27, 28? Correct. 26 is the short one. Okay. 27 is the short one. 27 is the short one. Whatever number you want to give. 27 is that, and then 28 will be the handwriting at the bottom. Okay.
Okay, and if you want, I'm going to spread mine out so I can just eyeball them while you sure. tell us about them. So we have... Okay. And if you look at, could look at those others. And why don't you just go through each one by number and tell us what it is, if you know. Okay, well, this is this, this one, 26, is, is the statement that Mitchell, my press guy, issued on my behalf. And it's similar to the, uh, the press guidance that is in uh, 25, I okay. guess. Okay, so you had reviewed these before they went out, correct? No, well, I, I drafted it. Okay. I now, and, and I'm just going to focus on, on WBR 25, which, as I understand it, is one of the ones that went out. Is that right, sir? 25, I think it's... Uh, yes. Yeah. 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 And talking about the decision to hire Ms. Lewinsky was based on her qualifications. Yeah. Uh, the decision to hire Ms. Um, I'm sorry. The decision to hire Ms. Lewinsky was based on her qualifications, initiative, and reputation as a hard worker. Right. And I, I really just want to focus on the, that last portion, reputation as a hard worker. What, if any, um, efforts was made by you or your office to determine anything about her reputation? Well, this was my, th this was my phrase. She obviously in the interview, in the resume, uh, based on uh, anybody that works at the White House and the Department of Defense. Uh, this is something that I sense very much was part of her uh, attraction, that she worked hard, that she had initiative, that she had qualifications. That, that's it. It's In terms of reputation as a hard worker, is it accurate, sir, that at least on that issue of what others thought of her in terms of working hard or not, that there had been no inquiries um, made, to your knowledge, with anyone that she had worked with? Well, let me say, John Podesta uh, said to me he wanted me to interview her. He mentioned Betty Curry's name. This woman worked at the White House, legislative affairs. She worked at the Pentagon. She had a security clearance. She gave a good interview. Uh, she was, her, her qualifications were consistent with the job that I wanted. I mean, that's... So, if I understand what you're, the, the answer you've just given us, you're giving us um, reasons why you believe that this was a good, um, a good assessment of Ms. Lewinsky in this press statement, is that right? Right. Okay. right. My question, though, is a little more specific. Did you or anyone at your direction, to your knowledge, ever speak to anyone? that Ms. Lewinsky had worked with about whether she was or was not a hard worker? I, I, don't, I don't know. I don't think so. I... So the reputation is based on uh, the interview and in addition your conversation my with judgment. John Podesta. My judgment. Right. But when John Podesta mentioned Ms. Lewinsky to you, he didn't even mention her name. <coughs> right. So he really wasn't vouching for her reputation. No, or but, but he, he wanted me to talk to her. The assumption was that she had some qualifications to interview her. So that, I, I assumed that. And her resume assumed, uh, here's somebody that in a short lifespan has done a lot. Now, if we look at um, WBR 28, which has the handwriting at the bottom, sir, yeah. you'll see uh, the last line of what I, I'm assuming is a draft says she was referred to us by John Podesta and by Betty Curry, and that's lined through. Yeah. And then it says, alternative suggested, Ms. Lewinsky was referred by individuals with whom she had previously worked. Do you see that? Yeah. yeah. Is that your writing? No. That's, did that's you, Cooper's. Did you even see it in this version at all? No, to your I never saw it. Okay. And I think there was some, you know, I'm going to volunteer something. I think there was some discussion about putting John Podesta and Betty. And, and I, I said, no, well, I made the decision. I'm not going to finger anybody. And so that's why that was deleted, just because your view, it was your opinion or conclusion that just based on the fact of your interviewing her, you didn't really want to bring up these other people's names well, in the press release. Well, eventually, I assumed this would get out. How, how was she referred to me? But I wasn't going to put names out. Uh, I wasn't going to finger anybody. I made the decision. Uh, just because she was referred to us by John and Betty didn't mean that that's why I hired her. I, I made the decision to hire her. And I, and I was not, 
I, I don't even remember seeing this, but I remember somebody said, well, shouldn't we say that she was referred to us by John and Betty? He said, no. I hired her. I'll take the responsibility. And I want to get this out today. I said, I don't want to, you know, I'm not going to dilly-dally. Let's get everything out up front that we know now. This is our position. We get it out the same day. And uh, I have nothing. This is routine. I have nothing to worry about. I've done nothing improper. Uh, and then if we look at uh, WBR 27, which is the last document, actually, I think it might be the one you had in front of you, sir. 25? No, no, I'm sorry. 27. Right. It's this one. Right. If you look at the... Um, uh, <laughs> now, this version is a good bit different than what ultimately went out, or at least somewhat different. You know, right. Would you agree? Right. Now, uh, did you even see this draft? No, I didn't see it. Okay. Does any of this language even look... Uh, uh, um, familiar to you? No. In other words, do you think that this is, that the fact that what ultimately went out is different than this, is that something that, would you have looked at this document and weighed in on why it shouldn't be used? No, no, no I just, dra I remember drafting it myself. Okay. Now, um, the no. position that you were considering Ms. Lewinsky for, I think you told us the name of the person who now has that job? Paul Aronson. Okay, and you believe he was hired in February or March? Well, no, he already was at the mission. We just moved him. He was in the political department. So we moved him. Okay. And um, when was the decision made to fill that slot with anyone, even though it later turned out to be Mr. Aronson? Do you know? Um, Cooper can answer that. Um, she suggested it to me. She wanted, I think, two slots that be turned over under her purview. <coughs> and I agreed on one, because I thought that two was a little excessive. And that was... <laughs> And that was Aaron's. Okay, and how many people were interviewed? Now, I, and let's just bracket the time. Obviously, at this point, we're talking after the time that Ms. Lewinsky declined the job. Yeah. So sometime after early January, but before February or March, whenever Mr. Aronson was given that, that position, correct? Yeah. Um, how many people were interviewed for that position? I don't know. I don't know. Do you have any recollection of interviewing anyone for it? Yeah, I think I told you before that there were, there were some junior type people that I met with that we had thought about uh, some names that come from the White House that I think Cooper may have interviewed some people. I know she had resumes, but um, that I personally interviewed, there may have been a couple, I think. I, I don't remember. When we were talking earlier, we, uh, we were talking further back. We were talking back before you made the offer. I was, I was including the time period even before you made the offer to Monica Lewinsky. What I'm focusing on now is a little more narrow, and that is the time period after Ms. Lewinsky declined the job, which is January, yeah. through the time when Mr. Aronson oh, was, did I interview other was hired for the job or, or switched to the job. During that narrow time period, which I guess is anywhere from a month to two, depending on when Mr. Aronson was switched, did you interview anyone for that position? Yes, I believe I did interview a couple of people, uh, but I, I don't know if it was specifically for that position. I was sold on Cooper's argument that we should shift Aronson to that position. But we still had a slot, <coughs> and so I wanted to fill the slot. I have filled the slot, so I was interviewing people for the slot. But Lewinsky's position was taken by Aronson. So there was no need to interview anybody for Aronson's position. Okay, so, so your best recollection, if I understand it, is you may have interviewed people for, na namely being a new employee, but it, would not, but it would not have been for the position that Lewinsky was offered because Aronson was already slated for it. Right, okay. right, right. Um, did you actually do an interview of Mr. Aronson for that position? Yeah. I had talked to Paul, um, and, and I had basically said to him, what do you want to do? He had come to me in the fall and basically said, I want to work closer with you in your personal office. And uh, I'm not very happy doing you know, my work in the political section. And as a matter of fact, uh, the State Department has offered me a position in Washington, but I'd like to stay here closer. When, approximately, when did he come to you with that pitch, with that request? About working for me in yeah. general? Yes, sir. About the fact that the State Department offered a position, so. 
I think it was in, in January. It would have been post Monica, as far as. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. All right, and then last thing, um, there's at least we've seen in the press lately, there's been some press accounts that you might become the Secretary of Energy. What, what's relevant to this here? Well, I guess it's relevant in that it, it's relevant to us to know if you are having any discussions with anyone affiliated with President Clinton about possibly a new job. We believe that's relevant. And so my question is, have you, um, is, is there, I'm not asking you to tell us whether you are going to be the Secretary of Energy, if that's not already a decided thing. But my question to you is, is it accurate that at least your name, um, to your knowledge, has been bandied about as the possible Secretary of Energy? Look, can I go to talk to my attorney? And Absolutely. Take Just, a leak to yeah, and you can tell your attorney that we are basically, this is all we have to go through, so we'll be done okay. in just a few minutes. Be off the record at 103.21. Back on record 113.36. Okay, Mr. Uh, I mean, I'm sorry, Ambassador Richardson, before we broke, I was asking you about um, some of the, the accounts in the press that you might be currently being considered for Secretary of Energy. Um, to your knowledge, uh, are you at present someone who is being considered as a possible Secretary of Energy? Well, I only read uh, what I see in the paper. That's the extent of my knowledge of this. Um, is that a position, to your knowledge, uh, who would appoint that position? President would. Um, when did you first become aware of the fact that your name is at least being kicked around to someone who could be Secretary of Energy? I read it in the uh, Washington Post, uh, Al Kamen's call. I was overseas when I read it. And when would that have been? Um, it was about two weeks ago. And had you, at any time, since you become an ambassador, and strike that. Is Secretary of Energy any position that you have at any time indicated uh, to other uh, political associates, or, or frankly anyone for that matter, that you might have an interest in? No. In fact, I, I don't see it as a job enhancement situation. I, I think I'm better off where I am now. But no, no, I have never sought that position. And um, has, so is it accurate then that at this point no one has affirmatively, other than reading press accounts, no one has affirmatively uh, discussed the topic with you? That's right. That's right. And I'm sorry, you might have said this and I might have just spaced, but is that someone that would be appointed by the president? Yes, the president appoints the secretary. Do you have any understanding, strike that, has anyone ever communicated to you or suggested to you that there might be any link in terms of any timing of an appointment to the Secretary of Energy position and any information that you might be uh, able to or actually provide relating to Monica Lewinsky or that whole matter? Absolutely not. The White House doesn't even know I'm here with you. And I'm assuming also then the second question which is similar is setting aside whether anybody's ever suggested that to you on your, in your own mind. Is there any, do you have any concerns or views that might, there might be some link between any talk at this point about the president appointing you Secretary of Energy and any information that you might uh, be called upon to provide in the Monica Lewinsky no, matter? There's, there's no connection whatsoever. And, and it's never crossed my mind. On the Monica Lewinsky thing, I very clearly, uh, what I did was routine. Uh, I was not pressured. I, I feel very good about what we did. I, I make no apologies. But the answer is no, there is no linkage. They don't even know I'm here. And I believe we had one other document. One last we document. To go over with um, this, I guess, is a, a memo from Isabel Watkins to you. It's dated January 22nd. And let me just, for the record, we're talking about WBR 29, correct, ma'am? Right. Yeah. And uh, the memo reads, uh, Gene Randall is sending directions to his home. Dinner is scheduled on Tuesday, February 3rd. As you noted, he expects Bill Press and his wife, James, and Debbie Schiff, White House, to join you. Yeah. Um, so that would be February 3rd. That would be roughly uh, 13 days after this whole thing broke. Do you recall having any conversation with Debbie Schiff about this matter at this? No. No, but... Um you know who Gene Randall is? He's with CNN. Mm -hmm. And he had done a dinner a year ago 
with a group of his friends. Debbie Schiff was there. And Gene, since then, since I got appointed, has been saying, I want to give you a dinner. And we've been unable to give him a date. In fact, we canceled this date. This never happened. Oh, okay. So, uh, and he had invited, he is a friend of Debbie and Jim Schiff. Well, have you had a, have, ever had a conversation with Debbie Schiff about Monica Lewinsky? No. Okay. Do you have any idea why uh, Debbie Schiff was the person, if you recall, she was the one who on October 24th <coughs> faxed the resume to your office in New York. Do you have any idea why Debbie Schiff, at least is the named person, sending the fax? She did. I didn't know that. If we, should we... Refer well, let's back up and be, uh, just make sure we're being precise. As you may recall, and we can show you the exhibit, I think it's the first or second exhibit, the fax notation at the top of the resume says Debbie Schiff. Th that doesn't necessarily mean that she was the person sending oh, it. Sending. Oh, yeah. Do you see that, sir? Yeah. What is that? Yeah, That's yeah. on WBR1? Yeah. Right. And just to be clear, that doesn't necessarily mean that she was the person who actually inserted the page in the fax machine, but... No, I no idea. Why. I don't know why it... Maybe a lot of people use her fax. I don't know. Right. Have you gotten together uh, socially on any occasions with Debbie Schiff? Well, that a year ago, yeah. Or maybe, no, it was when I was in the Congress. I think it was two years ago. Since at our home, at, at the home of Randall. And since that time, have you ever gotten together with him? No. I, I don't want to say him, I meant with her. No, no. Now, you uh, can't help but note that just coincidentally, the date of this memo to you is January 22nd, the date the story broke in the Monica Lewinsky matter. And it was scheduled for shortly thereafter, and you indicated to me that it was canceled. Was it canceled? Was the, the fact of the cancellation, did it have anything to do with this? No. Breaking story. No. No. February 3rd? No. No. It's just, I, something must have happened. In other words, I had, the, I had something, and I couldn't do it. Right. But it would be something not related to Monica Lewinsky or the, yeah, no. the issue with the president, correct? No, I wouldn't. <laughs> uh, a couple um, last questions. Um, you probably already answered this, but other than that one meeting with Betty Curry in which you hugged, you had no conversation <coughs> with Betty about Monica Lewinsky. No. And how would you describe your relationship with Betty Curry? Well, I, I think we're... I, I like her a lot. She's a very sweet person. We're not particularly close. Um, she is uh, in the White House uh, office uh, joining the president. Um, it, it's a very friendly, social, hello, Betty, how are you? You know, she always gives somebody a kiss, and that's it. There's, there's nothing more. But I like her. I like her. She's a good, decent person. Okay, I think that's all we have, and we appreciate your time. Interviews concluded at 120.38. Can, can, can I? Uh, because it relates to... S you we asked... Need to play, we need to play one. <coughs> Okay, and uh, during, when we went off, Ambassador Richardson indicated he wanted to make a, a clarification or follow-up. Yeah, I, I just want to be sure that I am not leaving the impression that I interviewed people for Lewinsky's job specifically um, during uh, a certain period of time. Um, what happened was there was a pool of candidates mainly dealt with by Cooper. Um, and I can't recall any any ones that I interviewed that were competitive necessarily with Lewinsky. I did want to fill the slot, so I interviewed a number of people. And I just want to be clear, you asked me to produce names of people that I interviewed for the Lewinsky slot. I just want to be clear that if I talk to anybody, it was for positions in the mission, in the public affairs area, not necessarily Lewinsky's, because we eventually filled it with Aronson. You see what I'm saying? Right. So, and when you say you would have interviewed someone for a position, you just mean a body, but for a different job function than yeah. you would interview Lewinsky and that Aronson later got. Yes. Yeah. I just want to, so that you don't think I'm trying to come up with names that, that don't exist. Okay. I mean, I'm always interviewing people at all times, uh, junior positions, and uh, 
You know, I, I, I wanted, uh, I, I had a letter from a woman uh, who, from New Jersey, who said to me, um, my son called the U.S. mission at the United Nations and wanted to interview for a job with you. And he got a cold shoulder. Yet you interviewed Monica Lewinsky because she had some friends in high places. And I remember getting that letter and having Isabel call that woman and say, you know, you have a point. I'll interview your son. And I interviewed her son, and I'm keeping him in a pool. But uh, I'm not trying to gain points with a grand jury. But I, I do, I am very engaged in personnel issues. But I want to make two things very clear. Number one, under no circumstances did I ever discuss Monica Lewinsky with the president or Paula Jones. And number two, uh, we did not hold the job open for her for two months, as has been alleged in the press. Um, specifically, the position was offered to her. She asked for an extension. Uh, we had the Iraq crisis, so we were consumed by a bunch of other things. And then I told her to fish or cut bait. And I instructed my staff to do that, and I think my staff did that. Um, what, what is my last point? Um, let's see. That's about it. Okay. Uh, that'll conclude the deposition. Thanks again. 124.12. We'll return with more videotape testimony released Monday by the House Judiciary Committee in a moment. But first, a look ahead to programming later this week. Are we going to let the Grinches steal Christmas?